for. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mara Walsh and I'm your host today. Um, we do have a large group both on Zoom and on Facebook. So I'm gonna get right into the housekeeping for the Zoom audience. If you are having trouble with audio, the best thing to do is attach a headset or earbuds. You'll hear us the best way from any device if you're on either Facebook or, or um, Zoom and having trouble with your audio. You could also turn up your computer audio or you can adjust the settings in the Zoom video or um, the Zoom audio settings to adjust that. Next, um, the screen. If you are having trouble seeing the actual slide screen as opposed to the, um, the my video, you if you're on a device, you can swipe it to the left or the right and that will give you the slides. Or if you're on a computer, there's a vertical bar between my video and the slides. If you just move the bar over closer to me, you will see more of the actual presentation and less of the speaker. So those are two ways to be optimized to the best way for the presentation. Um, now that we have all that technology and optimization behind us, I will share a little bit about myself for those of you who don't know me. And I'm sorry for the repetition for those that have been on tours before. Um, but my name is Mara Walsh. I am in the United States and specifically between Philadelphia and New York. Uh, I started leading tours, physical tours with EF Girl Scouts um, tour group. And I started by taking Girl Scouts and their friends, their families on international destinations every summer. I have since expanded my travel program and added adult only tours, as well as family friendly tours. Uh, in nearly all of my tours, I partner with EF Tours and in their adult division, I partner with Go Ahead Tours. Um, there are a couple of reasons why I started these virtual tours back in May, I believe was the first one. One, I really wanted to support the tour director community during this time of no work, since we're not able to travel. And two, I really wanted to keep the excitement of travel alive for my travel group and extend that opportunity to those who learned about us through friends, families, Facebook groups, social media, and other means. You know, we've done several tours in the past weeks. Um, if you've missed any of them and you'd like to go back and hit the recordings of them, they are all available on my website, which is listed on the slide that you should be looking at, girltraveltours.com. And um, there's a virtual travel menu item at the top. You can click on that and go down and see all of the tours we've done in the past. Um, we also have a lot of exciting tours coming up after tonight. Uh, we have Germany, Transylvania, Japan, the Highlands of Scotland, Alaska, Vienna, Berlin, and more to follow that. As long as you're interested in viewing these tours, we will continue to produce them for you. And we'll stay connected on a weekly or biweekly basis traveling the world virtually. You can register for any of those future tours on my website again at girltraveltours.com backslash virtual hyphen tours. I will put that in the chat once I'm done talking so that you have that link. Um, also, um, today we are not gonna talk about the future tours anymore. We're going to be off to New Zealand and this is gonna be a great tour, but before we get going, I wanna share with you a few ways that you can interact with us. One, feel free to ask questions about the tour and to the tour director using the Q&A mechanism. There's a little Q&A button at the bottom of your toolbar. Those questions will be read at the end and they will be addressed by the tour director. If you have a question or a comment for me, please put that in the chat and I will address as many as I can and try to get back to you with all of the answers. If you're on Facebook, I will be reviewing the messages as we go along as well. So I'll try to get to some of the questions on Facebook as well. Um, at the end of the tour. And I always like to add an interactive poll in the tour um, just to see what your connection is to this region. So I'm gonna launch that tour right now. And essentially it says, what is your connection to New Zealand? People on Facebook, feel free to put this in the comments. It's, I've been in Love It. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future. I don't currently have any plans to go, but I'm interested. Or I'm solely interested in virtual travel. I'm gonna give you a minute to add your comments and to vote on this poll. If you're in the Zoom link and you don't see the poll, you can click on the three dots on the bottom of your toolbar and, and click on poll and that should bring it up for you. Okay, so I'm gonna look at the, wow, 
So it's interesting. I, I had a viewer ask me to add this option last week and it really has um, proven to be a good option. Uh, the, the biggest percentage of people have no current plans to go, but are interested, which means this, this virtual tour could sway people to have a newfound interest in New Zealand. So there's, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results so that you can see what I'm looking at. But essentially 36% uh, have have no current plans, but are, is are interested in New Zealand. Uh, many, 32% have plans to go in the future, and there is about 20% that have been in the past. Um, so there's also always a percentage of people who are here for the virtual tours, and we we love that that we can all experience the world through this. So I'm going to stop sharing that, and I'm going to get right into it. So um, regardless of how much you know about New Zealand right now, we hope to enhance that tonight or today on this virtual tour. And as we all know, a tour would not be complete without a fantastic tour director. A tour director is like a personal concierge. They, um, they stay with the group from start to finish. They handle all of the travel plans, logistics, and um, make sure that your trip is stressless and full of great positive memories. They're the, by far the most important person in your group. So um, because we're not traveling, these tour directors have no work. And I really thought this would be a great way to not only give them the, um, give them the opportunity to share the passion of their country and their, their, their work with us, but also hopefully give them a way to make a little bit of money. So I will share in the chat with you later how you can tip the tour director. It is optional, but if you enjoy the tour, it's a great way to give back. Um, I'm hoping that this virtual tour will not only reignite our desire to travel, but also allow our tour director to do what she does best, which is share her passion. So, um, my Facebook friends, I think we are combating the scammers and the fake pages out there better in the weeks that we've done it. But please know if, if there's a link in the comments, do not click on it. Don't go to any pages that ask for your credit card. Never give a credit card to enter a free virtual tour. Um, we have been reporting them, but unfortunately Facebook has been really slow to respond. So just please um, just be smart out there and and don't click on anything that, that um, asks for credit cards and don't click on any crazy, this is the real tour, this is the, this is the authentic one. You're on the right one. So just, just stay with me and know that my Facebook page is called facebook.com slash girl travel tours. If you're not on that one, you're not on the right one. So please, let's get going. Back to the virtual tour. So. Today, you can expect an amazing, educational, and fun virtual tour presentation to New Zealand. And we're lucky today to have a wonderful tour director here who's going to share her expert view of this country. I'm honored to introduce you to and hand over this event to our amazing tour director, Melissa. Melissa, feel free to come on and I'm going to stop my sharing. You can take over yours and you can share your screen and as you do that, I'm going to put myself on mute so that you can have the show. Thank you, Mara. And just get this going. So, kia ora. Kia ora, everyone. No mai, haere mai. And welcome to Aotearoa, New Zealand, the land of the long white cloud. And for some of you, welcome to Middle Earth. Um, before we go too much further, I'd just like to say thank you for your lovely introduction, Mara. And I'd also like to thank you, our virtual travellers, for taking time to join us on our journey through Aotearoa, the land of the long white cloud. I know there are two words you can use in New Zealand, uh, which will get you a long way. They are, of course, kia ora. That quite simply means hello. It is our informal greeting here in New Zealand. Uh, in the Māori language, it means hello, welcome, good health, come to me, etc. So kia ora to you, our virtual travellers, and thank you for taking time to join us today. Uh, I'd also like to extend a very special thank you to Mara for making this possible. As she said, tour directors around the world are not working and 
we love our jobs. Um, but most of all, uh, it is wonderful to have this opportunity to share New Zealand with you. And who knows, this could quite uh, possibly become part of our future travel experience and uh, planning. So let's uh, move on and talk about where we are. Now, I was uh, quite horrified when I was looking for a map to use here to see how many maps around the world cut New Zealand out of the picture. We are a long way from anywhere, but uh, we are, of course, down here. We are situated in the South Pacific. Our nearest neighbour is Australia, and we have a very special relationship with them and other Pacific Island nations, namely Fiji, uh, Cook Island, Samoa and Tonga, just to name a few. We're around about a 14 hour flight from the United States and at least that far from Europe. So yes, shows dedication if you're coming down to New Zealand. Uh, we have a very temperate climate down here. Uh, we experience four definite seasons and our weather is driven by the weather patterns in the Great Southern Ocean. Uh, we are also very strongly influenced by La Nina and El Nino, and this year is supposed to be a La Nina year, which means that's a, quite a wet year. Now we sit at 35 to 48 degrees south of the equator, and we share this position with very few other countries actually in the Southern Hemisphere. The North Island is uh, similar to, in Australia, Canberra and Melbourne, in South Africa, uh, Cape Town, and in Chile, Santiago, whereas the South Island is much more like Tasmania in Australia and mid to South Patagonia, so uh, really very uh, uh, cool. We're also at the front of the international dateline, so for that reason we of course, uh, one of the first countries to see the new day. Let us uh, begin with a map of New Zealand. Now, I apologise, it's not in the perfect position, um, but most people, when they think of New Zealand, think of only two islands. You might be surprised to learn today that uh, New Zealand's actually made up of over 800 islands. Uh, our population is 5 million and you would think that the majority of those people would be uh, spread evenly across the country, but in fact, uh, over 70% of our population live in the North Island, uh, with the remaining 30 spread through the South Island and of course the outlying islands I just mentioned. Now, um, we have a bit of a joke in New Zealand that although there's 5 million of us here, uh, there's about a million of us in other places in the world. Probably half of them are in Australia. Uh, but I digress, we'll move on from there. I just wanted to uh, show you uh, that New Zealand, uh, the lay of the land here. South Island is significantly larger than the North Island at around about 58,000 square miles. Um, the North Island is uh, 44,000 square miles or 100,000 square miles kilometres. Now each of the um, islands is really defined by different features. Let's just talk a little about the special club that we belong to. However, before we get into that, uh, it, it is part of this. Uh, we sit on the Pacific Rim or the Ring of Fire. So it's a pretty special club to belong to. We share that membership with uh, Japan, Indonesia and the west coasts of both South and uh, sorry, um, North and South America. So the Ring of Fire is really where the edge of the Pacific plate is. The Earth's crust is uh, made up of these different plates that move and the Pacific plate is quite large. Now New Zealand sits smack bang on the middle of uh, where that plate meets the Indo-Australasian plate. And um, those plates are constantly moving. So we get to enjoy that plate movement in the form of earthquakes and volcanic activity in New Zealand. Uh, it's also given us another name, which you might not be familiar with. We are also known as the Shaky Isles. We have an average of about two and a half thousand earthquakes per year. Right, uh, just I've included this diagram to show you what's going on underfoot. Uh, this is uh, on the left-hand side, 
something called subduction. Now, subduction is just a fancy word for plate movement. What is happening is the Australasian plate is heading under, sorry, the Pacific plate is heading underneath the Indo-Australian plate. And what we see that, how that manifests in uh, reality is that the North Island is stretching out, giving us a geothermal activity, and the South Island is having the Southern Alps, which are being uplifted by this plate movement. Uh, the diagram on the right hand side I have included to demonstrate the uh, fault line and exactly where it runs in the country. Right, we're just going to move to our next slide. Now, My apologies, technical difficulties. I'd just like to get one thing straight before we get going. You crazy Kiwis, so I hear this all the time. Um, now, we did not name ourselves after the fruit. I just wanted to make that clear to you. We did in fact call ourselves after one of our five species of Kiwis. These are ground dwelling birds uh, in New Zealand and the name comes from its call. Uh, Māori, uh, our native people, observed the Kiwi's call, and quite simply, that's where the word comes from. You would think that we would name ourselves after a cool animal, but in fact, in New Zealand, we only have two native animals. One is a bat, and the other is a New Zealand fur seal. Uh, so, Kiwi's, there we are. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about our journey, because we are going to start in Auckland. Auckland is the largest city in New Zealand and the reason I've chosen Auckland to begin is because a lot of people coming from international destinations will fly into Auckland. It's a great place to stop and to start your journey. Today we're going to travel through the North Island. When I was putting this together I had trouble deciding what I wanted to include and Quite simply, the magnificence of New Zealand is very difficult to condense into the time constraints we have. Every one of our 16 regions uh, is worthy of one of these presentations on its own. So I wanted to start by saying there are no bad choices as far as New Zealand goes. There are so many wonderful locations you can't go wrong. So uh, let us begin. Now, Auckland is the largest city in New Zealand and it occupies a very unique position in the country. So Auckland sits on what is known as an isthmus. This is a very thin piece of land. At its narrowest point, it is only three kilometres or just over a mile wide. Auckland also enjoys twin harbours. So this very thin piece of land gives us a harbour out to uh, the Tasman Sea on the west coast or the Manuka Harbour. And in the east, the Waitemata Harbour are uh, opening up into the Hauraki Gulf. Auckland also sits on the Auckland Volcanic Field, which is made up of over 53 different dormant volcanoes. Uh, so it is uh, quite remarkable and the landscape is dotted with all of these little volcanic cones. Now it made it a very desirable location both for Europeans and for early Māori coming into the uh, country. Quite simply the Māori could build their village or fortified village which is called a pa up on the top of these cones and then they could first of all see the enemy coming but also they could booby trap all of the entrances into the village. So it was a really important uh, position and very sought after, particularly because of the seafood resources uh, as well. So Auckland is our largest city with a population of 1.6 million people. Uh, you will find Auckland is reasonably diverse. We have a very large Polynesian population in Auckland and the North Island in general. We have a lot of Tongans, Samoans, Fijians and Cook Islanders, a close association with the country. The Māori name for Auckland is Tamaki Makaro, which means desired by men. So just an indication of how 
uh, important the region was. And as I mentioned, it sits on this volcanic field, uh, which is pretty much what defines the Auckland landscape. Now, if you were to join one of my city tours, uh, chances are I would bring you to this building. Oh, I was going to show you scenery, didn't you? Uh, I bring you to this building because this is the Auckland Museum. It has some phenomenal Polynesian exhibitions and geological exhibitions uh, within its walls. It is also our war memorial, which is hugely important in New Zealand. The main reason I would bring you here, of course, is the views. So looking at uh, this picture shows us the Auckland very clearly. Down in the bottom left hand corner is the building we were just at. This is the Auckland Museum and it sits in the Botanic Gardens. Directly above the gardens is our university precinct. So New Zealand has a lot of industries, education is one. We have a lot of foreign students in the country and this university precinct was established back in 1883. So it is one of the older ones in New Zealand. Directly above that, we can see the Sky Tower, which is visible from just about anywhere in Auckland. Auckland Harbour Bridge across to the North Shore. And then coming around to the left, uh, sorry, the other left, the right hand side of the screen uh, is Auckland Port, which is a key port in the Pacific. And um, the buildings you see on the right hand side are in fact built on uh, reclaimed land. So this is uh, to give you a, an idea of the layout of the city and the size of the harbour. For those of you that have been to Australia, and it's not a competition, but Auckland Harbour is in fact three times the size of Sydney Harbour, but it does also have a very large uh, working port in there as well. So from here, let's have a quick look at some of the uh, sites you'll see in Auckland. Now, the Harbour Bridge is fairly key. It was uh, opened in 1959 and about 180,000 cars a day use it. But what's important is that it has made a journey that used to be an hour and a half to get across to the North Shore, uh, less than 10 minutes, and that's provided that the traffic's good. Now, directly under the arch of the bridge, you may be able to make out uh, some sailboats. That is, in fact, West Haven. And West Haven is the largest marina in New Zealand. It is, in fact, the largest marina in the Southern Hemisphere. Auckland's other name is the City of Sails. And that is because one in seven Aucklanders owns a boat. Quite a remarkable statistic. West Haven was established around the 1940s and a lot of world uh, and New Zealand uh, sailing champions have uh, got their start here. Uh, with over 2,000 boats, it makes it uh, not just the largest in the Southern Hemisphere, but one of the largest in the world. It is adjacent to the Auckland Harbour Bridge and uh, the viaduct region, which has been redeveloped. This is home to upscale apartments, beautiful restaurants, cafes, and a uh, vibrant uh, bar scene as well. Uh, now, towering above all of this, you're going to see Sky Tower. Uh, Sky Tower is visible from just about anywhere in Auckland, and I apologise, that's uh, probably not the best location for it. Um, Auckland Sky Tower was opened in 1997. Uh, it is uh, 348 metres tall, so that makes it four metres or about 12 feet taller than the Eiffel Tower. And it is the largest, sorry, the tallest freestanding structure in the Southern Hemisphere, as well as being a telecommunications Tower, it's also a wonderful observation deck. So for the adrenaline junkies amongst us, uh, the uh, fun starts here, and that is uh, in the lift on the way up to the observation deck. Uh, you can, of course, uh, enjoy the sensation of vertigo as you ascend to the observation deck. You don't have to stand on this clear section, uh, but it is uh, a lot of fun. You are also able to, if you are mad, to jump from the top of the tower in a controlled harness dive. Uh, I prefer to sit in the beautiful restaurant uh, and enjoy either a coffee or a glass of something. Uh, but it is a lot of fun and a great way for you to get an idea of the layout of 
the city. Now, in the distance on the left hand side, uh, we see an iconic island in uh, the Waitemata Harbour. This is, of course, Arangi Toito. Arangi Toito is the youngest of the volcanoes you find in the Auckland region. At about 600 years old, uh, it is believed to be uh, the youngest of the 53 that we have. Its name, Arangi Toto, means bloody sky. And this is uh, so named after one of the Maori captains of the canoes or wakas, as they are called, uh, was badly injured on the island in a battle. Now, uh, you can take a tour out to Rangi Toto if you like. The transfer is about 25 minutes and the walk to the summit is about an hour. Or if you like, you can stay close to Auckland City and take a ferry across to the charming little seaside town of Devonport. Devonport is known for its beautiful quirky little shops as well as fantastic cafes and food uh, and uh, incredible views and uh, beautiful nature walks. And just as a bit of trivia, our, um, I hope, famous songstress, Lord, she grew up here in Devonport. Now, these are the beaches to the north of Auckland. I just wanted to show you that you really don't have to go far. There's magnificence everywhere around the city and it's not far away. This is probably my number one pick for uh, a visit to Auckland. It is Waiheke Island. Now, Waiheke means island of trickling water. Why, the word why, W-A-I, in the Māori language means water. And you'll see that featured throughout um, the presentation today. So, uh, Waiheke Island is home to about 9,000 permanent residents and it's only a 45 minute ferry ride from Auckland Harbour. So from the moment you arrive into Waiheke, it is pure magic. Uh, now, and forgive me if you are from there, but in the 1960s and 70s, a lot of the hippies arrived to the island and planted both grapes and olives. So as a result, we have this incredible area that has very well established olive groves, but also is renowned for producing um, Cabernet Sauvignons, Merlots, Chardonnays and Pinot Gris. So from the moment you arrive, the magic begins. You can take a wine tour if you like. You can indulge in one of the plowman lunches that will include things like oysters. The local oysters are superb uh, cheese. We have a lot of dairy, obviously, in the region. Of course, a bit of wine and uh, olives. At 45 minutes away from Auckland, this is a highly desirable location. Uh, you can also hire a push bike, as we call them, or a bicycle, as you may know it, and ride around the island. Or quite simply, you can enjoy one of the many beautiful beaches that Waiheke has. Now, during World War II, there were in fact uh, gun emplacements built here on Waiheke because there was the fear, of course, uh, that we were to be invaded. They're also built on uh, Rangi Toto and at North Head, also in Devonport. Uh, so there's something else that you can uh, have a look at. Now, anywhere you go in our summer months, and of course we are opposite to the Northern Hemisphere, the 1st of December marks the first day of summer. And uh, our, our summer, of course, includes Christmas. Christmas to us is barbecues, sand, swimming, and usually unbearable heat, but that's uh, another story. But in our summer months, namely from around the end of November through December and January, you will see this beautiful tree uh, blooming on the edge of the beach. This is the Pahutakawa tree, and we refer to it as the New Zealand Christmas tree. It's found in the North Island and has this wonderful red flowers uh, through our summer months. Uh, it does only occur on the um, coast. It requires sea air to grow to the size uh, that it is and also to flower. So uh, before we head on, I wanted to talk a little bit about who we are as a people. You've heard me talk a little about the Māori. Uh, it's important to understand um, how we all fit in 
we are a very modern country, New Zealand, and we're a fairly uh, eclectic blend of people. Um, Maori people, well, the first people of Aotearoa, are believed to have been here for around a thousand years. Europeans didn't arrive, or the English didn't arrive and settle here until the 19, uh, 1940s. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, 1840. And so we only have a very short, in terms of our English history, uh, background. We have in recent years had a lot of people arrive from different locations, so we are becoming a broader mix of people. But no history of New Zealand would be complete without the story of uh, Māori. So let's talk a little about them now. Uh, it is, according to legend, believed that Kupe was the first great Māori explorer and he came in his waka canoe across the Pacific Ocean using only the stars to navigate. Māori were particularly uh, good at navigating by the stars. And he came from Hawaii. Now, before you rush off to look for Hawaii on a map, uh, you won't find it. There's a little bit of mystery surrounding where Māori came from. It is generally believed that they came from an island or a group of islands in the South Pacific. Uh, we base that on the similarities between both the language and the culture of uh, a lot of South Pacific nations, particularly Hawaii and the Cook Islands. Now, I was fortunate enough to go to the Cook Islands a few years ago, and for me, the similarities were incredible, uh, but to be honest, it felt like I was coming home. So I think that's where the ancestral homelands are. Now, Kupe arrived and uh, into the harbour where the arrow is pointing to. This is Hokianga Harbour. And he returned to Hawaii, letting the people there know about Aotearoa, the land of the long white cloud, and then made many journeys, bringing eventually those people back to settle here uh, in the land of the long white cloud. Now, we can't say for sure exactly why they left Hawaii because the ancestral homelands were held up and revered uh, in all of the stories and the myths. Uh, but what we can say is that it could have been due to population, overpopulation, disease, food shortages. What we do know though is that cannibalism was rife uh, and something that only was stopped a while ago. Uh, and that was more to show domination rather than that you were hungry. So uh, with that out of the way, I thought you might be interested uh, to do, and that is brief, we could talk about Māori culture for uh, hours and hours. The word Māori also means the people. So that is what that means. But I thought you might like to uh, have a quick look at some famous Kiwis. So first of all, Russell Crowe, he doesn't really need an introduction. He's done so many wonderful things. Uh, he can be a bit cranky at times, and I apologise uh, to him, but uh, he's a great Kiwi when he's winning Oscars, and he's a naughty Australian when he's throwing phones. All right, here's a surprise for you. Yes, Keith. I know a lot of people think he was uh, is Australian, and yes, he grew up in Australia, but he was born in New Zealand, <laughs> so we're going to claim him as our own. Uh, now, uh, Keisha Castle Hughes. For those of you that have travelled with me, Welcome, lovely to have you. And you'll be familiar with Keisha Castle Hughes, who played Paikia Aparangi in the classic New Zealand movie, Whale Rider. She has gone on to do amazing things, and uh, her roles have included uh, a role in Game of Thrones. So I thought you might be happy uh, to learn that. So Peter Jackson, who single-handedly has uh, boosted the New Zealand uh, tourism uh, industry, uh, with his vision of Middle Earth and, of course, the release of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Uh, now, this one might be uh, someone you're not familiar with. She might be a little before your time. She is Lucy Lawless, who played Xena, Warrior Princess. The great Sam Neill, uh, who's been in many movies, including Jurassic Park. He has recently made another movie that, if you haven't seen, you should. It is very quirky, very Kiwi. It's the hunt for the world of people. And uh, it will give you a great insight into our sense of humour. Now, 
uh, Kiwi that is perhaps lesser known is of course a great national hero for us here in New Zealand. This is Sir Edmund Hillary and he was the first European to climb Mount Everest back in 1953. He's pictured here with uh, Sherpa Norgay uh, who joined him on that uh, journey. And somebody else you will probably not be familiar with is uh, Lord Ernest Rutherford who is credited with being the father of nuclear physics. He was a New Zealand born British scientist and he split the atom. He's the first person to do that. So a uh, very important figure in the science community. And perhaps one of the more famous here is at the moment, our Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern. Now she is one of the youngest Prime Ministers and she's the leader of our country. So I generally do not talk about two things on tour. One is politics and the other is religion. So now that we've touched on politics, we've got to touch on religion. The main religion in New Zealand is, of course, rugby, or should I say sports, all forms of sports. Uh, not all of us um, are the big rugby fans that we appear to be, but it does unite us as a nation and it inspires us to be better when we are playing especially against Australia. But that's enough said on the subject for now. We are going to move on to our next destination, which is located in the district of Waikato. Uh, so Waikato takes its name from the Waikato River that runs through the area. It's also New Zealand's longest river, at 452 kilometres long. It's unusual also because it flows from the south to the north. Waikato means deep, still or lazy waters and it is the name of the district or the region as well. We're headed to the caves. Uh, we are headed to Waitomo Caves. Now, Waitomo means why, means water. Tomo means the hole or the cave. So uh, that is a Maori description of Waitomo Caves. The caves themselves are over 30 million years old and they are home to probably the phenomenon that you've come to see, of course, the glow worms. <clears throat> now this is one of the places in New Zealand that tourism started. The local Maori were guiding tours here uh, of the Europeans or the English settlers that were coming in from 1889. Uh, and that's in fact something that still happens to this day. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the thing you've come to see, the glowworms, Arachnocampa luminosa is their scientific name, although it sounds like something out of Harry Potter, it is in fact uh, the scientific name. Now, uh, the glowworms themselves are the larvae form of a fly that produces a blue-green light known as bioluminescence. Now, this light attracts insects to it, which are then caught in the threads that the glowworms have hung from the ceilings of these caves. Mm, then they eat them. So if you consider the first part of their name, arachna, you get the idea. Uh, bioluminescence, quite simply, is the production of light by a living organism. And the picture here is a couple of uh, a group that I had that were tubing. And this, of course, is uh, what you can see. So that tubing effectively is uh, in the caves. Uh, bioluminescence happens in lots of different ways around the world. We see it in oceans, uh, fireflies, and of course, the glowworms. Now, we have seven different locations around New Zealand uh, that you could see them, but the caves are fantastic. They are part of the Waitomo Streamway system, so you will come out of the caves in a boat, usually because this is the perfect habitat uh, for these creatures, of course, quiet, dark and damp. Now, um, the tour is around about an hour and I highly recommend it because you have the added bonus of these remarkable caves. Just before we uh, leave glowworms alone, I want to explain something to you. So the glowworms are the larvae form of a fly. Now the fly's name <laughs> is charming. It's a fungus gnat. Mm. So 
the uh, larvae, of course, have these spider-like tendencies. The fungus gnat in its adult form, it is only purpose in life is to reproduce. And so this poor animal when it pupates or insect when it pupates uh, has no mouth. So anyway, I'm making it sound fantastic. Please don't let me put you off the caves. They are remarkable. And the examples you see here of stalagmites and stalactites are phenomenal uh, throughout um, the caves. Now, we are going to leave the caves behind and head into the beautiful Waikato district. The area is renowned for dairy farming and uh, we produce 3% of all of the baby formula in the world, which is a relatively large statistic when you consider how small we are as a nation uh, of 5 million people, of course. Now, the Waikato is a dairy farming area and in New Zealand, we are very volcanic. Our top soils are on average 12 feet deep, which makes it possible to grow all kinds of crops and sometimes a lot more quickly uh, than perhaps they would traditionally grow. But the Waikato was also home to another location and uh, I hope some of you are waiting to see if I'm going to take you there. It is of course the scene of another uh, set for a wonderful trilogy. It is of course Middle Earth and the home to the fabulous set of Hobbiton. So Hobbiton is where the Hobbits lived in uh, Middle Earth, of course. And Peter Jackson found this set by flying across private land in a helicopter. He had been looking for a long time for a location for Hobbiton. And uh, he found this dairy farm where he then approached the farmer and asked if he could uh, build this set for Hobbiton there. The farmer was not initially interested whatsoever. Uh, a little bit of transaction happened. And as a result, we have Hobbiton. Now the movies were made over 20 years ago, but the set is still here. It was due to be bulldozed uh, shortly after the films had finished being made, uh, but some bright spark uh, realised that there was perhaps money to be made and uh, they've managed to stop that from happening. Uh, the dairy farmer, of course, runs these tours of Hobbiton, which are private. You can't just rock up and uh, walk around the property, but it is so fantastic. It is magical. You'll feel like Gandalf's about to walk up or a hobbit's about to stick their head out of uh, a window. I apologise to those of you who are not Lord of the Rings fans. I think it's fairly obvious that I am. Uh, this is one of my favourite places uh, to go. Now, the success in the set was, of course, the devil in the detail. They planted these sets around 18 months prior to the movie being filmed and, of course, that led to the authenticity. The detail's incredible. When you start looking at some of the pictures, you can see the village notice board and the fire um, wood chopped over here. It is uh, truly fantastic. The old mill has been rebuilt and recreated, but uh, the tours all go through the Green Dragon. And for the diehard Lord of the Rings fans, I can see you rubbing your hands together with uh, glee. For those of you that are not Lord of the Rings fans, this is a really fun way to spend an hour or so. Uh, it is located just outside of the town of Matamata and it's a day trip from Auckland or a half day trip from Rotorua. Now you would of course uh, have to have a little beverage in the Green Dragon. Chances are you're not going to want to leave. But unfortunately, we have to move on. And I'm gonna also take this opportunity to say to everybody that, New Zealand is full of so many magnificent places. I apologise to those of you who are hoping that I'm going to go somewhere and I miss it. I quite simply am unable to fit everything that I would have liked to into our presentation today. We're now headed to Lake Rotorua. So Rotorua is uh, across from the Waikato in what's known as the Rotorua Lakes District or the Bay of Plenty. This is also the area that Coupe came into when that migration happened over a thousand years ago. So, Rotorua. Now, I apologise for the clarity of this picture. I have included this for a specific reason. Uh, 
Rotorua, the name, quite simply means second lake or second body of water. It was when the Tiarua people came into the region, the second lake they encountered. So the reason I've included this photograph is because Rotorua sits in the caldera of an old volcano. And I think the picture of the lake clearly demonstrates this uh, for us. In the middle, we see Makoya Island, which is the old volcanic plug. When the last eruption happened, the magma or lava would have hardened, forming what's known as a volcanic plug. Eventually, this would have had birds and whatnot landing on it, uh, bringing seeds, and it would have been covered in vegetation. Uh, the lake is only 63 kilometres around. Uh, and Rotorua itself is home to 65,000 people. The lake is super shallow, uh, but um, it's not the lake that, that would be commonly be used in the Rotorua district by um, the people. Now, I have chosen to spend a little bit of time here in Rotorua because there are a lot of things to do, but also this is where there is a lot of geothermal activity and uh, of course, the geothermal activity really defines this region. So Rotorua is a very beautiful town. Uh, you could call it a city, but it's still quite small, right on the edge of the lake. What you can see here are the government gardens. So some older buildings which have served many purposes over the years, but very splendid flower gardens, rose gardens, and native gardens, as well as the top two pictures are blue baths, which are the old original bathhouses for Rotorua. So the area is home to a remarkable resource. This is geothermal uh, uh, power, but it's the water that's created. So in this region, when it rains, the rain will percolate down through the soil and it will eventually hit those hotter layers of the Earth's crust, which are closer to the surface in our region, and they'll start to heat up. Now, as they heat up, they will start to rise, just like hot air, and they will also gather or take into solution a lot of minerals you'll find uh, in abundance in the Rotorua uh, region, namely silica and sulphur. Uh, Rotorua's other name, by the way, is Sulphur City. Here we go, a bit of a tip as to what it might smell like here. Uh, and then of course, so these have amazing therapeutic powers, these mineral spa baths. And this is the Polynesian Spa, which is one of my favorite places to go. It's right next to the government gardens in Rotorua, on the edge of the lake, open to the sky, it's about 11 pools, and you work from the coolest through to the hottest. It is a religious experience, needless to say. It is considered one of the top 10 in the world. Uh, of its kind and, uh, as I said, one of my favourite things to do. Now, towering above all of Rotorua in the distance is Mount Tarawera. So Tarawera is responsible for one of the largest eruptions in living uh, New Zealand memory. <clears throat> Back in 1886, Mount Tarawera erupted and buried what was then considered to be one of the great wonders of the world. Now, we do rely on artists rendition uh, and very old photographs to see these they were the pink and white terraces te otu kapurangi and te tarata so pink and white terraces these are the results of thousands and thousands of years of mineral water with silica in solution running over these terraces and depositing that uh, the terraces were supposed to be incredible to view, uh, but in 1886, when that eruption happened, uh, it disappeared, never to be seen again. So these are the old photos I spoke of, and I am denied about whether to include them, but I wanted to include them to show you uh, early Māori enjoying um, the bath, and of course the early European or English settlers coming down. Now, this is also the beginning of tourism in the Rotorua district. And the reason for that is there were skirmishes between Māori and English back in the 1840s and 50s. And a lot of the soldiers returning to Auckland were bringing back these stories of the wondrous properties of this uh, healing 
magical water in Rotorua. So uh, it is something I can highly recommend uh, that you investigate when you come. 1886 saw the eruption of uh, Tarawera, and again, we do rely on artists' renditions for uh, this. The eruption was so large, it blew the top off Mount Tarawera. It buried 10 different villages, as well as the pink and white terraces, and it was uh, so loud it was heard uh, at the bottom of the South Island, which is a very long way away. It opened a 16 kilometre long volcanic rift and it is uh, available for you to walk up to if you would really like to. Now, this is not for the faint hearted. This is a moderate walk. Uh, if you think you're out for an afternoon stroll, then yeah, uh, leave it to the fit people. You can just see the helicopter flights up here, um, but Tarawera is a compelling location to visit uh, any day of um, the year. Now, the geothermal activity also gives us so many unique things in this neighbourhood, and this is one of them. So this is a geothermal village. It's a living village, and I can highly recommend doing the short one-hour trip there uh, to see how they use this geothermal resource, resource to, uh, to bathe, to, to cook, uh, and to heat their homes. Uh, it is used in Rotorua. The Rotorua Hospital, in fact, uses the uh, geothermal uh, water to, to heat the hospital. So we're going to just talk about this because I know some of you are going to uh, have a heart attack, but I, I want to explain to you before I say it. So in the Māori language, the pronunciation of the letters W and H are phonetically pronounced as an F. There are a few times that we do not do this, but I am now going to pronounce the word you see here. And this is not the full name of uh, this village. I didn't include the full name because I'll be honest with you, I'm not able to pronounce it, uh, but I can pronounce this. So this is Te Whakawerawera. And yes, I did just say that. Uh, the WH, of course, is the F. Now you're all practicing, aren't you? Uh, there are some times we don't do that and uh, here you can see the short version of what we call this village. We don't use the F here. And I know some of you have now just practiced and now you know why we don't use the, uh, the WH as an F. We quite simply call it Waka. Okay. Waka is incredible. Uh, you'll learn more about culture in Waka. It's also adjacent to the Pahuta geyser, which is the only geyser in New Zealand. This erupts around about every hour or so. Uh, it's inaccurate to say that it erupts on a regular basis, but it's about every hour or so. Uh, and you can easily access this from uh, beautiful Waka. Interestingly enough, when the Chilean earthquakes happened uh, some years ago now, the geyser here in Rotorua stopped working for two days. So just another indication of the invisible connections of that Pacific Rim. Within the park and in many public spaces all around Rotorua, you will find boiling mud or bubbling mud. And yes, there's steam coming off it, it's hot, don't touch it. Most uh, public parks will fence this off and occasionally, not often, there'll be an eruption somewhere and they'll have to hastily come in and fence off an area of the ground in Rotorua is uh, particularly thin. But you don't have to go to Waka to see this boiling mud, you'll see it everywhere. And if you are playing golf in uh, Rotorua, you have the unique experience of the bunkers being boiling mud. Needless to say, there's no uh, retrieving your ball. There are many things to do in this region, including taking a mud bath if you'd like to at the geothermal park known as Hell's Gate. You can also walk around park and uh, have a look at the activity there and very very well defined uh, pathways and of course New Zealand as an agrarian society three of our top four industries are agricultural and the agrodome showcases this for you it's a fantastic location only a short 45 minute uh, presentation on all things agricultural if you've never been on a farm or you don't know much about farm animals this is a really fabulous uh, way to enjoy that and you will uh, learn more about sheep than you thought was humanly uh, possible. Okay, 
So Rotorua is also uh, an adventure capital and although there are many uh, adventures, uh, bungee jumping, swooping, quad bike riding, the area is famous for mountain biking, all kinds of things. I have chosen to include Zorb. Uh, two reasons, I love it. Uh, and also Andrew, who is the inventor, is a local and a really great guy. So uh, this is the Zorb track. If you've ever wondered what it's like to roll down the hill in a ball at speed, it is a mixture of exhilaration and terror. Uh, it, it is also a lot of fun. And sometimes I'll take groups here and I'll only have one or two people intending to do this and lo and behold, everybody goes. Now you don't have to do it, you can quite simply go and watch uh, or check out the views. Just enjoy watching your friends disembark the Zorb at the end of it all. Now the Redwoods are one of my favourite places in the region to visit, anywhere where the trees happen to be. The Redwoods are part of one of the largest man-made forests in the world, uh, it used to be the largest. They are also part of an experiment that was done between Harvard and Cambridge universities. And the idea was to plant different varieties of trees to see how they would grow in the New Zealand soils. Uh, and the redwoods, when they cut one of them down, uh, quite simply, it crumbled. So it was unable to be used. So instead of knocking these trees down, they um, created this wonderful area that you can ride bikes through, horses walking, and the undercarriage uh, is all uh, tree ferns, so New Zealand uh, native uh, tree, which is a really beautiful area. I encourage all my groups, if it's uh, good weather, to come through and enjoy the redwoods. They've also put in a fantastic walkway, which is, um, I beg your pardon, is about midway up the trees and you can really get to see them up close. It's a self-guided walk. You can also do it at night time. They have these wonderful light installations which really make it a, a special experience. So from, if you're in Rotorua, uh, no doubt you will go to Ahangi. So Ahangi is a traditional Māori feast. It's cooked in the ground in the Rotorua region using the geothermal resources there. In other parts of the country, with no geothermal, we will use hot stones that have been heated in a fire. This is a tradition a lot of other nations around the world share, including the, the Luau in Hawaii, as well as the Mikilovo in Fiji uh, and so on. And a hangi uh, would have uh, chicken, lamb, uh, kumara, which is a sweet potato for us, uh, fish, seafood, of course, are all very popular. Now, pre-European Māori wouldn't have had lamb or chicken on there. It would have been the birds and the seafood, of course. Now, if you come to a hangi, uh, you will also take part in a ceremony at the very beginning. And the ceremony is to establish one thing. Do you come with peaceful or warlike intentions? Now, the warrior here is pictured doing something called the pokana. A uh, polkana is the protrusion of the tongue, the rolling of the eyes, and he is holding in his hand the Māori weapon of choice, the tire ha. Um, the ceremony would involve a warrior laying down a token, usually a fern or a branch, and the visitor picking it up, showing they come with peaceful intentions. I've never been to one that we didn't go with peaceful intentions. So. Uh, Chances are too, oh, I don't know how that slipped in there. I apologise that <laughs> you'll also see the haka, uh, which is being performed here by the mighty All Blacks led by the great Richie McCall. But I digress. The haka is the Māori posture war dance and it was traditionally performed by Māori warriors going into battle to psych themselves up as well as uh, frighten or intimidate the enemy. The idea was uh, they would be was so fierce and frightening that perhaps the enemy would run away and the battle wouldn't have to be fought. Uh, picture if you can 500 of these warriors stamping their feet, the dust rising around them, the tongue sticking out and the guttural sounds coming from them. 
I know I'd run away, but I don't believe that was uh, the outcome on most occasions. Um, but the haka is only performed by men. Girls don't be upset by that. Women are held in very high esteem in New Zealand, generally in charge, but let's move on from that. Now the haka is uh, taught in schools. You can see the boys doing it here, businessmen, sporting events everywhere, of course. Uh, we just had a huge uh, rugby game recently, a few days ago, Bledisloe between Australia and New Zealand, and that is also where you would see the haka being performed by your blacks. The idea, of course, is to psych out the opposition. So we also like our tattoos in New Zealand. We are a very heavily tattooed people. It is a bit of a badge of honour, and it's known as te moko, so skin art. Uh, what you can see here with the warrior is a full face tattoo. So in days of old, when I was a child, it wasn't necessarily uh, as socially acceptable as it is now. Uh, attitudes are changing and we are finding now that these full face tattoos are starting to appear again uh, in our communities. This is not a tattoo that you would have in one go and the traditional way of um, creating these tattoos is in fact with a chisel, and then the wound would have ash from the fire rubbed into it to give it that black colour. Done over a long period of time, and usually only chiefs and great warriors would have these full face tattoos. And more girls, you get them as well. Uh, this is the tattoo that would typically be on the chin of a married, married woman or a woman of very high status, including the blacking out of um, the lips. And we are starting to see a little more of this as well in New Zealand. I personally, I love it, um, but uh, you don't see it as uh, it, like it was uh, in the old tradition. So we are now headed to our next location. And this is a place I have chosen because it is the road less traveled. Tongarero National Park is unique. Uh, it's a wonderful location to see the geothermal uh, activity there but the main reason I've chosen it is because it is the first national park uh, created in New Zealand, it's the oldest, and it's the sixth oldest national park in the world. Uh, the park itself is over 800 kilometres long and it sits in the Ruapehu district. Uh, Ruapehu is the mountain you see on the far left hand side of your screen. So there's one covered in the snow there. Now, uh, Ruapehu is a uh, composite volcano. What you can see here is from the left to the right, Ruapehu, Narahoe, and behind our screen, I apologise, is Tongarero, which are the three uh, peaks that make up this uh, part of the Tongarero National Park. This is a World Heritage listed park UNESCO recognised it in 1990 for both environmental and cultural values. So the environmental values are ongoing examples of geological processes and the cultural values are intangible uh, cultural values of the Māori. There are a lot of sites within the park, including the summits of both Narahoe and Tongarero, uh, what we call tapu or sacred uh, to the local Māori. So, Ruapehu. Ruapehu is the mountain that the district takes its name from, and it means pit of noise. <laughs> now, believe it or not, uh, Ruapehu is an active volcano with two ski fields on its slopes. And the other thing that I always find amusing is that there are, in fact, 18 small glaciers on the slopes of Ruapehu. Now, this is a stratovolcano, and other famous stratovolcanoes around the world include uh, Vesuvius and Krakatoa as well. Uh, but Ruapehu is home to the village, and you're going to hear another word, and I'm going to just say it, Whakapapa, uh, is the village you'll find on the slopes here. There are so many wonderful walks you can do around Mount Ruapehu. You can see off to the side, very rich, fertile uh, pastoral land, as well as a lot of forest. The area is part of, um, it sits with, the park sits 
right on the boundary of both Taupo, Hawke's Bay and Ruapehu. So uh, pictured here on the left hand side you see a skier sitting uh, skiing on the slopes of Ruapehu and the summits of both Narahoe and Tongariro in the distance. Now these are tapu so you're not supposed to climb either of these mountains um, but back in 2000 uh, there were a couple of people trying to get in there and that quite simply is because this was the set for Mordor and Mount Doom in Lord of the Rings. Now Tongariro National Park is also home to the Tongariro Alpine Crossing. There are many incredible walks you can do in the park including through forest and through waterfalls in our summer months uh, up to the summit of Ruapehu but the Tongariro Alpine Crossing is considered one of the top 10 day walks in the world. It will take you approximately seven hours in good conditions. And it is a moderate walk. It's not for uh, the faint hearted, let's put it that way. If you would like to see lava flows and uh, mineral lakes, this is the crossing for you. Right, so from Tongariro, we are now going to head to our last destination in the North Island. And I apologise if you were hoping I was going to Cape Rianga or the Bay of Islands or Coromandel or, or any of those wonderful places. Again, there are no bad choices in New Zealand. I have just tried to stick to places that I hope you'll come to and visit, uh, but that also have meaning. So we're into Wellington. So Wellington is the capital of New Zealand. And this aerial shot shows us the beautiful natural harbour that Wellington sits in. The city itself is just off to the left hand side, but what you can see here is the runway for the airport. Doesn't that look like fun? And yes, it is. Uh, it is not capable of taking large aircraft. You can't make that out. It is uh, just in the middle, I beg your pardon, just in the middle of that screen. Uh, you can see the runway ends at water and begins at water. So when you're coming in on a, uh, on a plane on a windy day and Wellington is renowned for its wind. It's a lot of fun. Often you can't see the runway until you're actually on it. But anyway, I digress. Wellington. Wellington is our capital. And a lot of people ask me, why is Wellington the capital? Well, Wellington hasn't always been the capital. Auckland was the capital uh, before that. And in fact, there was a location even further north of Auckland that was our capital once upon a time. Now, before 1865, Auckland was the capital. Wellington had uh, was a town and one of the big industries in the Wellington region was timber or forestry. So they were cutting timber and shipping it from the port here at Wellington. Uh, so this was becoming quite a big industry for New Zealand, but more importantly, something was happening in the South Island of New Zealand that was happening in other parts of the world as well. We were having the gold rushes and they were occurring in the south, as well as the rise of sheep farming in the South Island. It was becoming really difficult to administer government from the geographical distance uh, that separated Auckland from the South Island. So we moved the capital to Wellington and that's where it has been since 1865. Wellington is famous for its uh, cable car, which you can ride to the top here and walk down through the beautiful botanic gardens. Uh, and it's also uh, where our parliament is. Now this is called the Beehive. I don't think I have to explain to you why it's called the Beehive. It is full of very busy politicians at the moment because you're probably not aware, but uh, New Zealand is having an election in four days time. So the other building you should see whilst you are here in New Zealand or in Wellington at least is Te Papa which is our national museum. This is an incredible building but it tells the story of New Zealand in a very unique way. Uh, I couldn't recommend Te Papa more if you are in Wellington and you have a spare couple of hours. It is a remarkable uh, museum to visit. It's also home to the Waitangi Treaty. Uh, this is a glass replica of the Waitangi Treaty. This was the treaty signed between Māori chiefs and the English settlers back on February the 6th, 
1840. And the Waitangi Treaty effectively signed all the lands of New Zealand over to the English in exchange for things like blankets and muskets and trinkets. It was contested in the New Zealand High Court and uh, as a result of uh, that High Court um, verdict, a lot of the land and uh, ocean or fishing rights were handed back to uh, Māori, which is great. Now, a lot of people in New Zealand have Māori lineage, whether or not uh, it's something that's obvious, a lot of us do, myself included. Um, that lineage is called uh, your whakapapa. Okay, so I wanted to just put that out there because for a lot of us, um, culture, of course, for most of us in New Zealand, culture is a living thing. It's part of everyday life. The Māori people were never fully conquered by Europeans, and I think it's important uh, to remember that. Uh, we're going to leave uh, Te Papa for now, and we're heading across to... I've included this because the Weta workshop is where the magic happens. Uh, Weta, of course, is responsible for the digital animation of things like Avatar uh, and The Lord of the Rings. And you can go and do these incredible backstage tours uh, at, uh, at Weta. Um, just outside in the car park, you'll find some of the trolls from The Lord of the Rings. And uh, speaking of trolls, what monster have I got here on my hand? Uh, well, I thought you might be interested to know what a weta was. So a weta is a native New Zealand animal. Uh, we do, there are other countries in the world that have them, but we share the honour of um, this being. We don't have many animals, but we've got this giant insect. It is, in fact, one of the largest in the world. It weighs in at uh, around about two and a half ounces or one kilo and sometimes has been known to outweigh a mouse. Um, fossils tell us that wetters have been around for over 180 million years. So that is quite remarkable. Single-handedly in the last 200 years or so, uh, we of course introduced rats and the rats are hunting them so they have become endangered. Now the name Weta means God of ugly things in Maori, and I think that's a little bit mean. Um, but before you do feel sorry for them, they can jump. They are enormous, as you can see in the picture. I'm not terribly scared of them. I can pick them up and move them, but they don't like you to touch them. Um, they have ears on their knees, and they breathe through their exoskeleton. They have a unique adaptation. Our cave and alpine wetters are able to survive in the winter by freezing completely solid. And then in springtime, they thaw out and continue on around their business. So uh, remarkable and very unusual insects. And that is the wetter. And on that uh, charming note, we are headed to one of the greatest places in the world. You can tell I'm a South Islander. It is Te Waipunamu, land of greenstone water, or the mainland, as we South Islanders call it. Now. To get there, you would take the uh, Cook Strait Inter-Islander Ferry across, across Cook Strait, uh, which is one of the most treacherous pieces of uh, water in the world. I wish for your crossing uh, that it is a calm day. It is between three to four hours to get across to the little town of Picton, which is where you either disembark or embark for your ferry crossing. Before we do, however, I wanted to give you an idea about um, the South Island. So this um, satellite photo shows us very clearly the Southern Alpine fault line. So from the bottom of the west coast of the South Island, running all the way up, so this is the left-hand side of the island, you can see a black line. This is the Alpine fault line. This is where the plates, in fact, uh, meet. And on the uh, opposite side, the green area you see there, are the Canterbury Plains. So uh, this is a very large, uh, 100 miles by 40 miles uh, wide uh, farming area. And of course, this is also where Christchurch is. Just behind our boxes there is the Banks Peninsula, which is the nose that sticks out into the Pacific Ocean on the east coast 
of the South Island. So uh, that is a bit of the layout of the land, but you can clearly see the fault line and the Pacific plate, which crumples as it's going underneath the Pacific plate, is very clearly evidenced by the Southern Alps. So we are headed to God's country. We're headed to a beautiful location. From Wellington, our ferry service takes us into the Marlborough Sounds. And Marlborough is famous for a few reasons. Uh, if you're coming on the ferry, on the right-hand side, you're coming out of uh, Wellington Harbour and you come into one of three different sounds. Now, the sounds are Queen Charlotte at the bottom, Kenna Peru and Polaris at the top. They are a boating haven, uh, a fisherman's delight. It is a superb area. This is an area popular with a lot of Kiwis uh, for our own holidays, as we call them, or vacations. Uh, and the Marlborough Sounds are a network of drowned river valleys. They provide us with about 1,500 kilometres of coastline. So you can see why this would be a popular location to come to, as well as being home to the Marlborough region, one of our famous wine growing areas. Uh, this is what the drowned river valleys look like and Picton is a tiny little town. Now, if you're traveling from Wellington to the South Island, chances are you're coming over on the ferry. It is a car ferry. You can put your um, vehicle on there. Or if you fly, you'd probably fly into Christchurch or any of the other locations and then drive back uh, to the Marlborough region uh, at the top of the South Island. So yes, it is our premier growing area for Sauvignon Blanc. The area is famous for the production of Sav Blanc, but also uh, very famous for seafood in the area. Because of our temperate climate and our soils are perfect for producing uh, this variety of wine. And to be honest, you could spend your entire trip here in the, in the Marlborough region, uh, but we're not going to. It is a delight, uh, fantastic local produce. The wine Salador tours are fantastic. And of course, the beautiful scenery. Uh, pictured here is, is, I beg your pardon, is Wither Hills Estate. And I do want to stop here because the other estates that you might visit are Clowney Bay uh, or Villa Maria uh, or Yeelands. There are many in the neighbourhood. This is a very typical New Zealand style. Uh, for the winery using the local stone there. But I have included this next map for the wine, uh, the wine lovers amongst us. Uh, it shows you all of the different wine regions in New Zealand. And as you can see, there are plenty. Chances are, wherever you go, there will be somewhere uh, that you can uh, sample one of the various varieties uh, that we grow here. Uh, I think it's our 11th largest export uh, here in New Zealand is wine. Now, adjacent to the Marlborough region is this little park, and I've included this little park for one reason. It's the Abel Tasman National Park. It's tiny, it's under 100 uh, square miles or 130 square uh, kilometres. And the reason I've included it is the great Dutch explorer Abel Tasman in 1642 threw an anchor down here in these beautiful bays. You can see they are stunning. Turquoise water, white sand, private beaches. This is a beautiful area and very popular with us for our holidays uh, as well. But Abel Tasman had the intention of exploring New Zealand and he did not have a very good time with the local Māori. In fact, some of his landing party were killed and he sailed away, leaving us with only one thing and that is our name. He grew up uh, close to an area known as Zealand and gave us the name New Zealand. That, that's where it comes from. Now, this is also able to, uh, an area that you're able to access the spectacular west coast of the South Island. The west coast is rugged, it is wild, it is worthy of an entire trip in and of itself. So I've chosen not to spend too much time here I'm taking us to one location, uh, which I think is fantastic, uh, and that is Punakaiki. We call it the Pancake Rocks. This is uh, on the west coast of New Zealand. There's not a great deal on the west coast. There are several towns that you might choose to visit, 
But Punakaiki is a place you could come to. When I was a child, you could actually go and sit out on these rocks. <clears throat> They're called the pancake rocks. What they are are layers and layers of sedimentation that have been uh, compressed under the ocean over a long period of time. Now, during an earth building period, that uh, sedimentation has been uplifted and then the softer layers of that sediment have eroded at a different rate to those harder layers, giving us this distinctive uh, uh, form we see here. Now, geologists call it stylo bedding. As I said, we call it the pancake rocks. Now, the reason you come to the West Coast is it is extraordinary. Uh, the Southern Alps literally come straight out of the ocean uh, to the side of you. And it is home to towns such as Greymouth and Hokitika. Uh, Hokitika is where our one, it's a very important location, and that is because it's where you'll find New Zealand's national stone, Punamu. So this is New Zealand nephrite jade, and although jade is found everywhere in, New Ze in uh, the world, nephrite jade is only found in the South Island of New Zealand. Now, Punamu is the Māori word, for greenstone and is highly valued by the Māori people. It would have been traded by the southern iwis uh, with the, who are the tribes, the southern iwis with the northern, uh, northern iwis because they didn't have access to greenstone. However, uh, they would have traded this highly valued treasure. Uh, in days of old, carvings are believed to possess, or pendants are believed to possess uh, mana, which is prestige or power, and they're handed on from uh, family member to family member. You may not be able to see, but I am actually wearing greenstone beads that were given to me by an aunt. Uh, the symbols we see here in front of us are generally taken from nature. So on the right, we have the ads, the hook in the middle, and the symbol on the end is known as the koru. Now, the koru is a particularly important uh, symbol for us as Kiwis. It was taken from one of our native trees. This is a tree fern. And from the tree fern, we get this symbol. So you can see here the tiny beginning of a fern front. Koru is the representation of the unfurling of new life, new beginnings, new start. And it is found everywhere uh, throughout New Zealand. You'll find it on our money, on our artwork, tattoos, paintings, in carvings. This is just a bit of gratuitous art for you. It is symbolic of New Zealand and recognisable by Kiwis everywhere instantly as being um, a New Zealand symbol. So something important to remember, the koru is a symbol we see all the time. It also gives us an other symbol which you may or may not be familiar with. It is the emblem of New Zealand, the silver fern. Now here you can see the fern is turned over and the underside of this fern is in fact white or silver. Uh, not all of our tree ferns are of this variety. This was a very special tree and this was typically used by Maori warriors when they were raiding an opposing village. They would hold up a piece of this silver fern turned upwards to reflect the moonlight so that they could creep quietly into the village and the warriors behind them were able to see the way because they were holding this fern above them. Uh, so it's very special to us. It's become the emblem of New Zealand. It's on all our sports uniforms and as well our sports uniform uh, colours are black and white. We like it so much it's even on our plane. There we are. You can now understand when you next see an Air New Zealand plane what all of that fuss is on the tail. So we are going to move on to Christchurch. Now I've included Christchurch uh, because it's the largest city in New Zealand. Uh, sorry, in the South Island, I beg your pardon, but just under 400,000 people, but also because it's my hometown. So uh, Christchurch is uh, sits in Pegasus Bay, just above the Banks Peninsula. And this picture is in fact taken from the hills where I grew up. So we're standing on the Port Hills looking northwards towards the Kaikoura Ranges in the distance. Kaikoura is another fantastic area 
famous for whale watching, um, pilot whales, sperm whales, humpback whales, November through to April. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll see dolphins, uh, seals and uh, albatross. Uh, it's also the entire region is stunning. Uh, it's also home to fantastic Hamner Springs, which is one of the South Island's natural thermal uh, mineral baths. Looking out to the west, we have the Canterbury Plains. Very, very beautiful area, completely flat, uh, and they take you up to the foothills of the Southern Alps in the distance. So, um, the Canterbury Plains are in fact crisscrossed by these beautiful rivers and you'll see them everywhere if you come uh, to the region. These are known as braided river, rivers and this is the Rakaia River. So when the snow melts in the mountains, uh, it will run down, hit this flat surface and then spread out, giving us this braided river effect, which can make some of these rivers extremely wide. The Rakai is not so wide, but the Waimakariri is over two kilometres uh, wide and uh, quite something to cross. Sometimes they've got a lot of water in them, sometimes not so much. But as you can see, they are all shingle beds, which is the underlying foundation for the city of Christchurch. Now you are looking at the Christchurch of my childhood here. Christchurch is known as the garden city. Uh, it, is home to so many beautiful public spaces, famous for the cherry blossom, the daffodils in our spring months, the wonderful botanic gardens, uh, which you'll see here, and all of the fantastic public spaces. Also, the stunning stone buildings that made Christchurch, uh, what we, we used to say is more English than England. Uh, this is the sightseeing bus, and it's parked outside the um, Christchurch Museum, but also the art centre behind it. So it gives you an idea of the style of building uh, that we had in Christchurch. Now, um, this is the Avon River, the river that runs through Christchurch. It uh, is um, a beautiful river. You can hire a paddle boat, it's a unique way for you to enjoy uh, the city. And that of course is the Avon River. However, September 2010 and February of 2011 uh, saw a series of earthquakes on a fault line that had not been active for over 14,000 years. Uh, with widespread destruction throughout Christchurch, I wondered whether or not to include this, but my main reason for including Christchurch in the beginning is I want you to know that Christchurch is open for business. It's also a beautiful city in its own right and the gateway to many beautiful regions. This is the Christchurch Cathedral and we are rebuilding, it's supposed to be around a 20 to 30 year project. So um, on the other side of the Port Hills is Littleton, which is our harbour. Now it unfortunately sustained uh, quite a lot of damage in the earthquakes and hasn't returned to full operating capacity, but it's beautiful. Littleton sits on the other side of what's known as the Port Hills and it's connected to Christchurch by a tunnel. This is a photo looking up towards Littleton. Uh, so on the left hand side of the screen at the top, you can make out the Port of Littleton. Coming around, we're standing above Governor's Bay looking out across to Diamond Bay. We are standing again on the side of a collapsed crater of a volcano. Uh, the Banks Peninsula, the entire Banks Peninsula, once upon a time was exactly that, a uh, volcano. This is a boaties haven and uh, the beaches are superb, amazing local produce. Um, the area has incredible uh, cafes, has a bit of an art scene, and it's only half an hour away from Christchurch. I've included this shot of the Banks Peninsula just to give you an idea of uh, what it looks like from a satellite, from the sky. Christchurch appears just at the very top on the right hand side of this slide and the small harbour that you see at the very top there is Little Tin Harbour where we've just been. What I'd like to point out though is the huge natural harbour that you see in the bottom left hand side. Uh, this is beautiful Akaroa. And Akaroa is the French settlement in New Zealand. Back in the 1880s, the French 
uh, made a small settlement in this divine natural harbour. It's home to a lot of dolphins. And uh, if you were to take a, <laughs> take a cruise ship, um, which we hope happens again soon, uh, this is the port you come into now. Little Tim is unable to handle uh, that. However, Akaroa only has a population of about 600 permanent residents. So you can imagine what it's like when a uh, cruise ship arrives and uh, allows uh, 2,000 people to, to hit Akaroa. So an absolutely amazing location. And this will take you about two hours uh, from Christchurch to drive to. So let's, uh, you can see the French influence. The street signs are still in French and a lot of these buildings are very old worldly and uh, charming, magical location. The Banks Peninsula is also home to many different walks which will take you out to the coast. And this red tussock grassland that you see is a feature right throughout all of the country and the next place that we are headed to. So we are headed down now into the heart of the South Island and Mackenzie country. This is the beginning of the Alpine region and the Mackenzie Basin sits between the foothills and the Southern Alps. It's really the beginning of our lakes district in the highlands of, uh, of the South Island. Now, Mackenzie country takes its name from a very unfortunate Scottish gentleman uh, who was really tricked into stealing a large flock of sheep. And unfortunately, he was jailed for the crime. Now, we don't really know what happened to poor old Robert Mackenzie, but uh, someone obviously felt really guilty because they've named the entire region after him, Mackenzie country. And as you can see, the Tussocks, uh, this is sheep grazing. Uh, uh, town, uh, country. Now, if you are coming to New Zealand in our spring and summer months, you're going to see these wonderful lupins. So these are the wildflowers that are right throughout all of the, well, mainly the bottom half of the South Island. <laughs> They're in fact an invasive species, but we like them, so we've, we've kept them. But you will see them in the lead up to the lakes. Now, our first lake will be Lake Tekapo, Maori word, uh, translation is sleeping man and that is due to the shape of the lake. Here we can see Tekapo is a very turquoise colour at the moment so that tells us it's being fed by snow or glacial melt. Uh, Tekapo, this is a really old family photograph I'm using here and I actually use it just to show how timeless Tekapo is because now there is a different road and whatnot here um, but Tekapo is home to many different ski fields. It is only a very small township, uh, but you have access to several different public and private fields. It also has the beautiful stone chapel of the Church of the Good Shepherd, which is an iconic church or chapel, uh, very highly sought after for weddings. Uh, the altar looks out across the lake and uh, you can imagine the waiting list to get married here is a couple of years long. Right next to the Church of the Good Shepherd is one of my favourite monuments and I've included it because I love dogs. It quite simply is a monument to all of the working dogs in New Zealand, uh, without whom the already very difficult job of sheep farming uh, would be a lot harder. So Mackenzie's dog, we used to call it, but it's not, just the working dog monument. Now Tekapo is also home to, it is a recognised dark skies region which means that it is, uh, has little or negligible additional light sources. Uh, Mount John Observatory is just off to the left-hand side on the hill that you can't see. Uh, and I didn't mean to cut that out of that picture, but this is a very busy observatory when there are things astronomical happening uh, in the skies, of course. So, we're going to continue on to our next lake, but I wanted to point this out because wherever you go in the South Island, you're going to find lakes. We generate electricity in New Zealand using hydroelectric power. So the water turns the turbines, of course, generating electricity. It's a bit of a bone of contention in the South Island because it's all the South Island lakes that have been dammed. But the canal system that you see here is part of a World War II post-World War II construction and engineering project. 
and it moves the water from one lake to the other. Of course, um, it's all part of our hydroelectrical generation scheme. So I thought it was worthy of a mention. It is quite hypnotic to look at and you will cross these canals as you head through to our next destination, which is Aoraki, Mount Cook in the distance. The lake here is Lake Pukaki and that in Māori means bulging neck. Aoraki is the mountain you see in the distance. Um, it is the highest mountain in New Zealand and the highest in Australasia. To the right hand side of its peak is the Tasman Glacier. Uh, the largest glacier in New Zealand and on the right hand side is the Hooker Valley and the Sefton and Mueller glaciers. Now we're heading into the, the Mount Cook National Park. Aoraki is one of my favourite places. I was fortunate enough to live here for a couple of years and uh, I've included it really for that reason only. Uh, once you get into the valley you are surrounded by these incredible mountains. Pictured here is Mount Sefton, and I've always found it difficult to believe that 30 kilometres from where we are in this valley, over the back of Mount Sefton, is in fact the Tasman Sea. You're very close as the crow flies to uh, the ocean on the other side there. And I couldn't find a way of fitting this all in in one picture, so if you swing around to the right, you will of course see Aoraki Mount Cook. Now there is no literal translation uh, for Aoraki. It is the Māori word, the place name for uh, the mountain. And Mount Cook, of course, comes from Captain Cook, one of the first European explorers to circumnavigate New Zealand. Now 3,700 metres tall, or just over 12,200 feet, might not be that tall in the grand scheme of things, but it's the tallest one we've got here. Now, when you get into um, the Hooker Valley, there are lots of things to do. You can take the walks. Some are longer than others. One of my favourite walks to do is up to Kia Point, which, uh, looking at this slide, if you see the word walk, uh, look directly underneath that, you can see what looks like a, a, a gravel wall there. Well, that is where this next uh, photograph was taken. That is standing on the other side of the moraine wall, the glacier wall, looking out to Aoraki. This is taken from Kia Point. I took this photograph last year uh, on one of my many walks up to Kia Point. Uh, Kia is our large mountain parrot and I hope you get to meet one of them. They're very cheeky. Uh, when you come to New Zealand, but Aoraki is in the distance. There are many walks that will take you to the other side of the glacier, but this is around about, I usually say, allow two hours for this trip. What you can see is the uh, rock that's been ground away by the glacier and of course then as the glacier melts it dumps those stones giving us these big um, moraine dumps. That flower, rock flower, also known as lurse, uh, is then transported in these rivers down uh, into our lakes and that gives it this very peculiar, very deep turquoise colour. You'll see that in uh, other lakes of course that are glacially fed around the world. Aoraki is beautiful at any time of the year and if you come in our summer months you also may see Aurora Australis, Aurora Australis, if you pardon. The Milky Way is very bright and often um, the moonlight, remember this is permanent snow and ice, uh, the reflection is bright enough you can actually read a book uh, at night time. Sadly we have to leave Aoraki and head into one of our great mountain passes. This is the beautiful Lindis Pass. And uh, any time of the season, this is a remarkable pass to come through. In the winter, it is uh, just as picturesque as the Lindis Pass. Uh, do make sure you bring your chains if you're intending to drive across the Lindis Pass. But it is the magical gateway to the beauty of central Otago. Now, I am a little biased. I spent all of my childhood holidays and any spare time we had in central Otago. This is one of my favourite places uh, in the world, in case you couldn't tell. Uh, so, it is famous, of course, for one town, and that town is Pointstown. Now, let us, uh, there's many places in central Otago, like Hawir, Lake Wanaka, Alexandra, Cromwell. You can't go wrong, let me just uh, put it that way. So Queenstown, 
Queenstown sits on the shores of Lake Wakatipu and is in the last 20 years or so become incredibly popular. Uh, it is one of the leading destinations for both Kiwis and international visitors. Uh, and the reason for that is it has something for everybody. It has scenery. This is the birthplace of extreme sports in New Zealand. Skippers Canyon, where the first bungee jump was done, is just outside in the gorge outside of uh, Queenstown. You've got helicopters, you've got skiing. We're right on the doorstep of the Gibston Valley wine region. Um, there's elves, goodness me, what more could you want? It is a fantastic location and extremely popular. Quite difficult to find a place to live if you are a resident and you don't own your own home. But that is, uh, of course, another story. Now, how does it get its name? Well, this is the region that the gold rushes occurred back in the 1850s and 60s. And allegedly, two miners were standing on the side of Lake Wakatipu looking across and one said to the other, hey mate, this is a view fit for a queen. And so the name has stuck, Queenstown. So let's do a little bit of uh, talking about the lake itself. It is an unusual shape lake. Wakatipu, the word Wakatipu means sleeping giant. And in this picture, you may be able to see what looks like a person that is, uh, has their knees pulled up and their hands raised to their head. So sleeping giant is the Maori name uh, for Wakatipu. Now, Queenstown, and this is just a beautiful photograph by my, my dear friend, Julia. Thank you, Julia. So Queenstown is unique. It, uh, the lake itself was formed by glaciers uh, or a giant, if you'd like to believe the story according to Māori. And the brief version is boy and girl fall in love, not permitted to marry because she's chief's daughter. Um, girl, of course, uh, is very upset. A giant that lives in the mountains comes into the village, steals the maiden, uh, and then the chief, of course, declares that whosoever can uh, rescue his daughter can have her hand in marriage. Now, the idea of marriage is quite different in uh, the Māori culture than it is for us uh, in those days. Many tried and many failed to rescue the fair maiden, and, of course, the young warrior crept up. He bound the giant in uh, cords that were set, soaked in fat, and as he rescued the young maiden, he set fire to the bombs holding the giant, he then rolled down the hill and his burning body imprinted the shape of Lake Wakatipu at the bottom of the valley. So you can believe whether it was formed by glaciers or formed by giant, you can choose. Uh, it also has this interesting phenomenon called a situ wave, which is something that happens when a body of, wa of water is enclosed by land. And it happens all around the world in different places. Just like if you're holding a glass of water and you tip it uh, and straighten it up, that water, of course, is going to keep on moving. Uh, and so that gives the illusion that there is tidal or wave action on Lake Wakatipu, whereas, in fact, it is just this situ wave, which is caused by wind-generated uh, waves on other parts of the lake. Uh, according to Maori, however, it is the beating heart of the giant who lies at the bottom of Lake Wakatipu. Uh, it is the third largest lake in New Zealand and it is uh, very deep at over 750 feet, in fact, deeper than sea level in some parts. Now, it is also home to the Remarkables, which is the mountain range pictured here. The Remarkables are so called because they're one of two mountain ranges in the world that run from south to the north. And that other one is uh, the Rockies in the United States. You just see Queenstown down in the left and corner there. And it doesn't matter where you go, uh, this of course is Remarkables. There's also the Remarkable Ski Field, uh, which is difficult to point out there, but uh, it's also the namesake. This is the top of the lake, and you could be forgiven for wondering if uh, an elf or a wizard is about to walk out. It's being used uh, a lot in movies and miniseries, uh, both in uh, New Zealand and internationally. And wherever you go in Queenstown, chances are you'll see the Earnslaw, which is the uh, steamship built in 1912 that frequents Lake Wakatipu, taking people uh, from one side to the other 
one of my favourite places to go on the Ernst Thaw is Walter Peak. So this is an operating sheep farm just on the other side of the lake. It is magnificent. The food is superb. They do lunches and dinners. I cannot recommend this experience more highly. They do a sheep show uh, as well as um, uh, showcasing agriculture and sheep farming in uh, New Zealand. You're in the heart of sheep farming country in this part of the world. And of course, you get to enjoy coming over on the Earnslaw and back again at night time. So you get to enjoy uh, that scenery. It's really very special. Now, Queenstown is also the gateway to our final region today. And I apologize because I know there's so many places in New Zealand that are worthy of our time. This, of course, is Fiordland or Milford Sounds. Now, here in this picture, we see Mitre Peak, uh, which is the famous peak in Milford Sounds. Uh, it's so-called because it resembles the Bishop's Mitre. This is the township of Milford, if you can call it that. What you see is what you get. The largest thing here is really the runway. Scenic flights are very popular for Milford Sounds. The uh, buildings are associated with the, the cruise services. And there are several cruises you can do out onto Milford Sounds on a daily basis. This is a full day trip from Queenstown. You could stay slightly uh, closer at beautiful Lake Tianau, the Lake of Infidelity. Uh, or you could decide to make a day of it and come all the way from Queenstown, or you can fly in, which is a really quick and easy way to do it, and very, very popular. Once upon a time, there was a tourist hotel uh, here, just on the right-hand side, you can see those old buildings, uh, but um, not too many people live here in uh, Milford region. Mitre Peak again, and you can see these cruise boats. If you're lucky enough, you're going to see dolphins, whales, Definitely the seals, they frequent the region. And the area is also home to some of New Zealand's most incredible nature walks. Uh, here you can see a cruise ship that's come in. This is usually on the itinerary. If you're part of a, uh, a cruise, they'll come into Milford Sounds. The other sound is beautiful, doubtful sounds, uh, which is not as easily accessed. Milford is the more uh, busier of the two. Uh, doubtful you tend to need to be going on a boat or going uh, on a scenic flight. Now they're not called fjords but they are in fact true fjords. They are glacially carved but they were named sounds and uh, quite simply it hasn't, uh, hasn't changed. This picture on the left hand side shows you what you can expect if you were going to take one of our famous walks. So that's the Milford track, the Heafy or the Rootburn track all of them require for you to book, and uh, all of them are very popular in our summer months. So my friends, or well, for now, because you are now family, for now, uh, from the bottom of the country and from so many other locations around New Zealand, the limestone coast, Cape Reunga, Paihia, the Bay of Islands, Coromandel Peninsula, Taranaki, Kaikoura, uh, Bay of Plenty, all of the West Coast, all of the South Island, Stewart Island and all of the places that we didn't get to. I hope you've enjoyed our virtual tour of Aotearoa in New Zealand and I hope it has inspired you perhaps to come here one day. I'd like to thank you for your time and from here I'd also like to say Kaka Point down south of Dunedin, as we say in New Zealand, Kakate. That's awesome. Thank I'll you. And so back much. to you, Mara. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh my gosh. I have been to New Zealand and I feel like I need to go back now to see so many places that I wasn't able to see. So you really did show us so many places and I, I totally appreciate that. Um, before we get to the Q&A, which we will move on to in a second, I just wanted to put up a slide for our future virtual tours so everybody knows what's coming up. Uh, we have Germany, Transylvania, Japan, the Highlands of Scotland, Alaska, Vienna, Berlin. We're going back to Spain for um, Gaudi's Barcelona. So please, you know, if you want to register for those, please do so. And as we go into the Q&A, I just want to touch on the fact that, um, as you can imagine, Melissa could have done this tour um, with her eyes closed and, and <laughs> research if she was on, on a physical tour. 
but knowing that technology has to be put in place and and um, it's a whole different beast when you're presenting in this way. So if you did enjoy the tour, um, please know that um, I just I just chat it the way that you can send a tip to me, and then all of those tips will be accumulated and pushed on to Melissa as a way to thank her. Um, I am going to now move into the Q&A. If Melissa is ready and if you're going to review these, Melissa, this is like a rapid fire Q&A. So just dive in, read them off, answer them as quickly as possible and move on. We do have more than a, about 100 questions right now. We probably won't get to all of them, but we will do our best to try to get to it as many as possible. So I'm going to hand it back over to you, Melissa, and you can jump in. Thank you, Mara. Thank you. Okay, so, and thank you, everybody. I, I, I there is so much to New Zealand that uh, we were not able to fit in, but I, I, I hope that you enjoyed what you did here now. So first question, Daniel, what is the population? And apologies if I didn't say that, Daniel, we are 5 million people in New Zealand. Um, Mary Lou, we'll be traveling late March and April. Uh, look, this is a good question. Very nice time of the year to travel. Sand flies, I think you call them no see uh, or midges, but regardless, take insect repellent. I can't guarantee that they won't be there, <laughs> to be honest, and only in some places. Uh, the largest recorded earthquake, oh, uh, we have recorded um, the 7.4, but I believe that we have had larger, uh, larger ones. I'd love to tell you the travel restrictions, unfortunately, for um, Philip's asking uh, to update us about travel restrictions, uh, and I would hope that we lift them soon. And I can only apologise that you can't come here and we can't come there. In fact, I'm supposed to be on a tour in the United States at the moment. So uh, it's, uh, I, I really hope that uh, it's soon. Just keep uh, check the consulate website, should be able to give you that. Uh, Anonymous, you've asked me an interesting question. Um, do people eat kiwis? Absolutely not. They're a protected species. <laughs> but that was an interesting one to ask. Uh, Bree, you've asked, does the South Island experience more seismic activity than the North? And why is it that most people live in the North Island? Great question, Bree. Uh, a lot of people live in the North Island because it was the first place to be settled. Um, uh, it can also be driven by employment opportunities. But the South Island, see, it's only special people there. <laughs> it's terrible. I know the North Islanders out there are hating me, and I apologise uh, uh, to you for that. But uh, it was really just a matter of how the population spread. And it is significantly cooler in the South Island um, than it is in the North. Auckland has a lovely uh, temperate climate, whereas you can get snow down to uh, sea level in the southern parts. Two native animals in New Zealand are the bat and the fur seal. Yes, everything else is introduced. Uh, travel time by ship from the North or South America. Oh, I believe that is two weeks and people do it all the time. So I often have cruise groups that have come on that uh, one-way cruise from the States. And Alexis has asked us, what language do we speak? We speak English and Māori is the other language. You'll find all the... Uh, Signs are also in Maori, so you can practice your pronunciation. <laughs> uh, what food do we eat? Look, you know, there are so many things I wanted to include. Uh, seafood is big for us, not for me. I'm allergic. Um, kai moana is what we call that. Kai is the name for food. That's why we all secretly laugh when we meet someone called Kai, because that is the Maori word for food. Um, but we eat simple stuff, lots of seafood, lots of fresh produce, and as you can imagine, Dairy farming is one of our biggest industries, lots of cheese. Um, best time of the year to visit. Different things to see at different times of the year, Jacqueline. Um, the spring and summer can be changeable. The road into Milford Sounds is inaccessible if you have an avalanche come down <laughs> through the valleys there. And that is an incredible trip in and of itself. So difficult to say. Uh, but I would say try spring and summer. There's a magical quality to New Zealand in the air in the summer months that's difficult to, uh, to translate. Uh, but I would definitely try that. Uh, Jim's asked, do we get hit by hurricanes or typhoons? Uh, Jim, we're too far south, but we do get the big Antarctic storms that come through, uh, which can be quite frightening. That uh, That's not... Um, 
but the, the hurricanes, uh, to be honest, we have, we call them a cyclone in the Southern Hemisphere. We did have a cyclone come down last summer, which was the first time I think in living memory that we had had a cyclone come close to the New Zealand coast. Typically we're too far south. Uh, Ali's asked, are there a lot of deadly insects, animals in New Zealand like there are in Australia? No, Ali, we managed to keep them all in Australia. Um, we don't have snakes. We very, we have very few spiders. Um, before I moved to Australia, because I do live in Australia, I was terrified of spiders as big as a centimetre square. Last night I had one as big as my hand in my bathroom. So yeah, no fear of that in New Zealand. Uh, are there issues with erosion or flooding, Erica? That's a great question. Erosion, yes, and that's largely due to, in fact, we have a problem with rabbits. Um, rabbits, the uh, animal. I told a group once that the, anim the that rabbits were a pest. They were looking for all these big angry rabbits because they thought I said they were pissed, but no, it's, uh, they are, erosion is the issue that is really to do with um, uh, animal interference and hard hoofed animals. Um, the height of the tower compared to the Grand Canyon, I'm very sorry, I don't know that. It is, if you think the height of the Eiffel Tower, similar sort of things, it's definitely, um, uh, the Grand Canyon is definitely deeper. Uh, coming from Canada, how much time should I stay? Stay as long as you like. Three weeks to a month is a good amount of time. I definitely think, Gria, you need that much to see New Zealand. Eric is asking, um, with earthquakes, are there areas of New Zealand that are more susceptible or to tsunamis? Erica, unfortunately, we are susceptible to tsunamis. We have an excellent warning system. Uh, quite simply, you just need to be informed. Uh, and we have a really good uh, emergency system in New Zealand. We're a very modern country. People are often surprised about how modern we are. Oh, Dame Kiri Tikanoa. Leslie, what about Dame Kiri Tikanoa? I was going to include her, yes. I thought maybe a lot of people might not know her. You're obviously of my uh, generation, but she, of course, Dame Kiri Tikanoa, Māori opera singer, very famous, incredible uh, voice. I apologise for not including her. Um, the rugby statue is located outside. Um, Aaron's asking where the rugby statue is. It is outside Mount Eden in Auckland, Mount Eden Station uh, uh, Stadium. Uh, Mammy's asking if you can take pictures in the glowworm case. That is a great question because you cannot. Um, the flashing light and sound will in fact interfere with that. So they kind of get you there, but it is really great. They do a, a little booklet you can either buy or you can buy a postcard. Um, the cost of going to the caves, uh, are they accessible for older tourists? That is an excellent question, Michelle. Um, the cave cost, I'm sorry, it's not much. It's not um, uh, a lot of uh, money. The caves themselves may not be uh, accessible if you have mobility issues because there are steps required. You also need to get in and out of a boat. But there are ways around that and they do have a um, capacity to take people in uh another route. So if you uh, have mobility issues, my suggestion would be to contact the Waitomo Caves website and chat to them. Karen's asking, did I ever go to White Island before or after the eruption? Well, Karen, no, I've never gone to White Island. I um, have thought about it uh, on various occasions. Uh, no one has been to White Island other than the emergency ser services now. And if you were to ask me if uh, we were going to have a, 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 if I would go there now, my answer is, is no. How often do you have earthquakes? Lockie. Well, Lockie, I hate telling people this, but all the time. It's, um, it is, uh, the average we say is two and a half thousand a year. But that, you know, that could be in one place or another. I was in Queenstown last year when we had a pretty big one. Uh, that uh, was just off the Milford Sounds coast and we could feel it in Queenstown, so yeah. Uh, how fast, Kayla's asking, how fast does Zorb go? Uh, Zorb doesn't go as fast as, it, like, you do have to stop at the end. <laughs> so there's no need for you to be concerned about that. They have all of this 
things in place to stop you from uh, going out and onto the road and into the lake. Um, but this orb is really, really great fun. I, I can't tell you, I recommend it enough. I've done it many times myself. Uh, Cecile's asking, what makes Kiwi so adventurous? Uh, look, you know, that's um, something I was going to touch on, in fact. And Cecile, quite simply, I think it's because my generation, and I'm not that old, but uh, we, first of all, the pubs were never open on Sunday and TV finished at 11 o'clock at night. So we had to be quite uh, inventive and it wasn't unusual for friends of mine. I remember very clearly uh, my neighbour coming over and saying, hey, I'm going to take the sheet off my bed and I'm going to jump off the cliff at the bottom of the um, paddock. Do you want to come? I thought that sounds like a lot of fun. So, yeah, uh, I think it just comes from having it there, maybe being bored, a combination of the two, to be honest. <laughs> it's a bit tr tricky. Uh, Darby is asking, um, do I have any tips or recommendations for honeymooners? Oh, Darby, there's so many beautiful places you could go to. Uh, my suggestion would be perhaps get onto Airbnb and look for a really lovely place in, uh, in Queenstown. Um, Queenstown has something for everyone. And uh, <laughs> sorry, just reading another question there. And I think as a honeymooner, you would not be disappointed. There's lots of great experiences you can do together and lots of food and wine experiences there as well. Um, Jodie's asking, what is Māori life like currently? Um, the traditional practice you see are traditional practices. Māori life is just like everyday life for us. Māori are very modern people and uh, you'll find we keep culture alive because it is, um, it's living, it's important to uphold tradition and it also is a way of remembering who we are and connecting with our past. <laughs> now, Jen, Jenna has said, so uh, would you stick your tongue out to say hi if you were so peaceful? So, Jenny, Jenna, um, the polkana where the tongue is sticking out is uh, not a friendly action. <laughs> that is to, in fact, uh, scare people. That's uh, not a greeting. It's really done to test people. And uh, in the ceremony, if you were to go to a hungry feast in the ceremony leading up to it, it's really to see what you're made of. Uh, it's considered extremely rude, by the way, to laugh or imitate uh, anyone doing um, the pokana. It's, it is literally the worst thing you can do. So that's just a little tip for you if you are in, um, intending to uh, attend a, a hungry performance. It's really important to remember that. Anne has asked, is facial tattooing confined to non-Maori people? Uh, confined to, oh, confined to Maori people. Look, it's not, but if you are not practicing culture, it can be frowned upon because it is then, uh, in my opinion, it's really just aesthetics is the reason you're doing that. Uh, I believe in, uh, in culture and um, I think that the significance of the tattoos is, is more important than the tattoos themselves. <laughs> Jodie asked, do the local fear the ring of fire because of the potential eruptions? And they are monitored closely. Jodie, yes. Look, at the end of the day, you, um, you learn to live with it. You don't think about what's going on underneath your feet. Uh, you know, I guess like a lot of people in um, the United States that live on the San Andreas Fault could probably say, do you think about it? I do think about it, but uh, at the end of the day, God has a plan and whatever it is, it will be. So, uh, but I wouldn't be concerned if you were coming to New Zealand about earthquakes. As I said, we're a very modern country, but not only that, most of our buildings, especially the ones in Christchurch that are being rebuilt, have been built to withstand a significant um, Richter scale action. So uh, it is important to, to think about that. And if we didn't go to places because we were worried about what might happen, then none of us would ever leave our, our living rooms. <laughs> I know, sorry, like we are now. Um, Lockie's asking, does Wellington have any famous uh, landmarks? Wellington has, Wellington's an interesting city. It has, of course, Parliament House. It's a lot of administrative uh, buildings, Lockie. Te Papa, of course, Mount Victoria, which was used also in the filming of Lord of the Rings and lots of other uh, movies. Um, but to be honest with you, that is really, uh, Wellington is an administrative city. 
uh, it's also a very cool city. It's got um, a lot of really neat cafes, but I should also mention it has a massive arts scene. So that is something to think about. Very, very well-dressed people in, uh, in Wellington. Um, the primary industry in New Zealand. So the four main industries in New Zealand, I apologise, I meant to include this, are, um, first of all, dairy farming. So uh, that is a huge industry for us in New Zealand. Uh, sheep farming comes in second or third. Uh, forestry is also in the mix, so logging. And the big one also for us is tourism. So that is our top four industries in New Zealand. And uh, you'll find that there's other things, you know, we produce wine, we uh, sell education, there's all kinds of other subsidiary um, uh, agricultural industries as well. Uh, are there train services in places that are affordable, like hostels to stay in, like in Britain? Jenna, Jenna, that's a great question. We have a superb public transport system. Our trains are really, really good. And you might be aware that in New Zealand, we drive on the correct side of the road. So we're on the left-hand side, people. You just need to be aware of that. I would probably wait to try your driving skills until you're out of the main city of uh, Auckland. Auckland would be the only place I'd be concerned, though. Uh, now, what is New Zealand's famous food? Lamb. Lamb. Seafood, a lot of people don't realise, but seafood, of course, is... Uh, is uh, the dominant of oh, Kaimoana is uh, we are rich in seafood, seafood in New Zealand. Uh, are a lot of people in New Zealand Christian? At the end of the day, this is an anonymous question. Yes, most people believe in God. We may just not necessarily go to church as often as uh, other people do. Uh, Lisa has asked, has anyone ever referred to you as New Zealanders versus Kiwis? Uh, good question. Look, we're, they're both pretty much the same same thing. One I think is more affectionate than the other, the Kiwis is, is nicer. Um, the most famous places in New Zealand, Rosabel, I knew somebody was going to ask me this. Now, I probably took you to those places. Queenstown, I would say almost hands down, Queenstown is uh, one of the number one destinations in New Zealand. Coromandel is another place we did not have a chance to go to, but is incredible, uh, as well as the north of the North Island, Cape Reinga, uh, and the Bay of Islands, the, the entire North Island is different to the South Island, but both of them are spectacular. Um, Franz Josef Glacier. Franz Josef Glacier is fantastic, and that is situated on the... Uh, Dorothy's asking about Franz Josef. Um, most of the New Zealand tours that you do, if you are doing a solely New Zealand tour, you will run up and down the west coast of New Zealand usually do check that in your itinerary and most places are provided the weather is uh, allowed it will give you the option to take helicopter flights onto those glaciers so the west coast has the Franz Joseph and the Fox Glacier on it uh, they're absolutely fantastic. Uh, Kim is asking is there a Facebook page that's good to follow and enjoy and keep up with New Zealand that's a good question Kim. Um, I am I've obviously I'm fairly close to the news there. I look at stuff.com, which is a New Zealand news feed, stuff.com, if you're, or stuff, sorry, stuff.co.nz. Um, you will find in that that there'll be other links that might take you to places, but um, there are a lot of really great New Zealand photographers as well. The photography is wonderful, but it may not necessarily keep you up with what's going on in the, in the country. Are there any notable, Kayla is asking, are there any notable lighthouses on the water? <sighs> Off the top of my head, Kayla, I'm sorry. The final slide I showed you is the lighthouse at Karka Point, uh, which is just south of Dunedin. Um, that you can actually go and stay in overnight. But on the water, I, I apologise, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, Dorothy's saying she was in, in Christchurch in 2015 and was inspired by all of the rebuilding. Uh, do you recommend Kiwi Rail Trip? Now, this is the rail pass you can get for New Zealand. Absolutely. And one of the great rail trips in New Zealand is from Christchurch across to the West Coast through Arthur's Pass, which is another place we were not able uh, to, to go to today. Arthur's Pass is 
stunning uh, and we have very few mountain passes in New Zealand so Arthur's Pass is one way of getting to the west coast um, and the train trip here even if you don't use the train to get around in New Zealand the train trip to Arthur's Pass is worth doing. Uh, Vicky is asking what continent is New Zealand a part of? Well I'm glad you asked Vicky because I was in fact, going to include this in my uh, commentary before New Zealand is not a continent however um, I had this discussion with a geologist I had on board a year ago. Um, New Zealand is part of the no most newly emerging continent. If you were to come back in around about a million years, you would find us at the tip of the continent known as Zealandia. That's what uh, Zealandia is called. Um, what's the best mountain to ski on from Rosabel? All of them, they're fantastic. Um, the skiing, if you ski from Christchurch, there are over 150 different ski fields in the South Island of, the North, uh, of New Zealand. Some are private, but a lot are open to the public. You have out of Christchurch, Mount Hutt and Porter Heights. Um, you have in the Queenstown or Wanaka region. I am quite biased. Wanaka is home to Cadrona and Treble Cone. Queenstown is always busy, so you might want to get off the beaten track a little bit. Uh, that is home to the Remarkables and um, Coronet Peak. But you have a million different choices. If you really are after something specific in terms of skiing, you can um, contact me through Mara's uh, website. I might be able to give you some better recommendations. Um, what's the temperature, Karen? Excellent question. Sorry, I was trying to touch on that when I was talking about our climate. The temperature is, and we are metric, um, the temperature is quite cool at the moment. We experience four definite seasons. You don't really get much higher than about 90 degrees, let's say. Although with the warming of the planet, we are experiencing warmer and warmer sum summers. Every year, the, uh, the record is being broken for the hottest um, temperatures on New Zealand records. So um, we range in temperature from, and we get down to zero C, so 32, uh, right up to, I would say, um, 32 degrees C would be fair to say, double that, 64, around about 90, maybe 95 degrees would be the hottest you could experience. We are not humid. Auckland thinks it's humid, but it's not really that humid. So uh, just to let you know that. Um, how difficult is it to rent a car? Um, can you please practice driving on the right side of the road? The, the left side of the road, I mean the correct side of the road. It's not hard to hire a car. My recommendation is to make sure you have an international licence before you arrive into New Zealand. It's not something you can do before you, um, once you've arrived. The best time to see Aurora Australis is another question here. That is the uh, summer months, which is from December through to March. If you're lucky, you might see them in the spring uh, and in the autumn, which is the beginning of March through to the 1st of uh, June. Uh, Sharon's asking, many places you mentioned had Māori names. Uh, did they always have those names or were they renamed in recent times from English names? Excellent question, Sharon. Um, in fact, uh, one of the parties uh, running for election at the moment is uh, hoping to change all of the English names back to Maori. It's one of the premises that they're going in for, uh, in with. But no, a lot of the Maori names were retained. Uh, the um, English names have remained that way. What has happened over the years is that uh, they've made us improve our pronunciation. Uh, we used to be pretty bad. Now we work very hard to try and pronounce things correctly. Uh, Mummy's asking uh, what currency is in New Zealand? New Zealand dollar, of course. And Katie has asked, <laughs> can wetters bite? No, Katie, but they can jump. They're kind of creepy. But I'm not scared of wetters. I'm more scared of spiders. Um, the best and most economical time to visit, Karen, it is, in my opinion, Summer, spring and autumn, winter, unless you are skiing, winter is still sensational. And truly the North Island, it won't make, it, it, it will be cool in the North Island, but if you wanna go skiing, you need to come in the winter months, which is from June to September. Uh, we can be still quite cool. Even now in October, we're experiencing some uh, 
cool temperatures and as early as or as recent as two weeks ago we had snow on the ski fields in the south island so we are still skiing at the moment uh but um as for inexpensive unfortunately a lot of these places you'll find doesn't matter there's no seasonal difference and queenstown used to be a winter town now it's a year-round town a lot of our um little places and we blame lord of the rings for this of course uh have a have um, become very, very uh, busy and there's simply no uh, off, uh, off season. Right, I vaguely remember hearing a legend back in the 1970s about the feud between Tongariro and Taranaki. Yes, okay, that's actually, Anna's uh, asked an interesting, that is, uh, I, you are correct, Anna, that is a great story. I'm sorry, I don't have the time to tell it right now, but there are wonderful myths and legends associated with just about everywhere in New Zealand. Māori have their own gods, but uh, it was very easy and simple to convert them to Christianity uh, when uh, the missionaries and, of course, the English arrived here. Uh, can we come visit from the US? Uh, Anna asks, if we are willing to quarantine for 14 days upon arrival, how does that work? Anna, great question. Um, you have to be able to get on a flight, and that is the trick at the moment. We have around about 14,000 Kiwis stranded overseas at the moment that are unable to get home because, quite simply, there are no flights coming into New Zealand. If you can get here and quarantine, then absolutely, yes. And I believe the... Um, I believe things are going to change. Look, uh, things, uh, we are looking at a travel bubble between Australia and New Zealand. We can only hope that something significant changes uh, soon because, of course, we all miss travel, but we all miss each other. It, it's very difficult. Um, the country of New Zealand was founded, well, uh, hard to say because Māori, of course, are our first ancestors and the first uh, New Zealanders or Kiwis. Um, but the English occupied New Zealand from 1840. Is higher education free in New Zealand? Judy is asking this question. It used to be. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've got to pay for it. But, uh, yeah, and I just missed out. Uh, but, um, no, university, we don't call it college in New Zealand. It's uh, varsity or uni, uh, is not free. And, of course, it will cost will depend on what degree you are um, uh, pursuing the uh, that's a whole other conversation sorry education I just recently talked to a friend of mine about this um, are there any books that tell the folklore stories that you spoke about that's a great question um, there is a book I grew up learning all of these stories and knowing them uh, we uh, young stories to yeah stories to read to young New Zealanders uh, there are a lot of famous, uh, Margaret Mahey is a famous New Zealand author, but I would look quite simply for anything that tells you that, it, that it's entitled Māori Le Legends and Myths would be uh, what I'd be looking at there. Um, somebody has asked me here what Christchurch is like now, and I kind of rushed through that segment because it is difficult to talk about Christchurch even, even now. Um, Christchurch is still really fantastic. It's, for those of you that were fortunate enough to visit Christchurch prior to the earthquakes, it, it was considered the most beautiful city in New Zealand. And uh, it, it really, I would put it on par with Queenstown. It was just magnificent. The stone buildings, the gardens, et cetera. Um, the devastation that was caused by those earthquakes is still evident. You will find, uh, especially as somebody that grew up there, you know, the background to my childhood just disappeared, as it did for all of us. But um, as you drive around, a lot of the landmarks are not visible and things that I used to look for, uh, you don't see. So it, it is slightly different. A lot of the... Um, Buildings have been rebuilt and redesigned to be able to withstand uh, earthquakes. So I think you're going to find that Christchurch is absolutely worthy of a visit. And the main reason I included it in my presentation was I wanted people to know that. I know people have tended to avoid Christchurch, but you shouldn't. You should definitely, definitely put it on your list. Um, best condition, what are the conditions of Milford Sound for hiking and how fit must you be? Now, this is a very sought after track. They only allow a certain amount of people to do the Milford track every year. You can do a few versions of it. So you need to look online 
and check. You do need to be fit. There's no denying that. It is, uh, I think it can be five to seven days. You can do the economy class version where you carry all your own stuff, or you can do the posh one where you don't carry anything and you arrive at the beautiful accommodation and there's a three hat meal already prepared for you. Uh, but either way, you must book in. You can't just turn up. In my day, when I was a kid, you used to be able to just turn up and, uh, and do those walks. But now, because of the popularity, they don't want a lot of people on the track. And it is extremely remote. You don't want uh, anything going wrong, so they limit the amount of people there. Uh, Susan's asking the temperature for early April in the North Island and South Island. Early April is still, we're going into autumn. It's a beautiful time of the, the year to visit. You'd be looking at... High teens, early 20s, so double that and add 32. Maybe 60s to 70s would be uh, what I say there. Um, my thoughts or tips on van life or renting a van. Everybody does this and I would recommend it. Most people, look, New Zealand is a logical sequence. You can start in the north and head south or the south and head north. But um, Maui campers are the brand you see everybody using. And we have some of the nicest camping grounds in the world. Everybody tells me when they come to New Zealand, wow, how clean the country is. And I agree. Uh, yes, we are very clean. And that's because we are taught when we're kids not to drop rubbish. It's a really, really big deal. Uh, so I would be inclined to come um, uh, in those months, I think you would find early April is a beautiful time of the year to be here. Uh, is the Cardboard Chapel in Christchurch still open? Vivian, great question. I think it is, but I'm actually not in Christchurch, I'm sorry to say. I hope that it is, but the project of rebuilding the cathedral is said to be taking around 20 to 30 years. <laughs> Kimberly, Kimberly's asked, are possums still a problem? <laughs> So for those of you not in the know, the possum is a beautiful creature. We love possums here in Australia. Uh, he is a native to Australia and he was introduced for hunting, his pelt, his fur, of course, uh, by the English uh, aristocracy back in the uh, 19th century. Unfortunately, he loves our trees and he, has, um, he can go through and ring bark our native forests overnight. So he causes massive dev devastation. So much so he's called public enemy number one in New Zealand. So yes, he is still a problem and we make fiber out of his fur. Whereas what's amusing is of course is uh, we think there's 95 million possums in, in New Zealand and they are a protected species in Australia. So there you go. How long a time required to adequately tour the North Island and hit most major sites from Randy? Randy, ah, Look, how long is a piece of string? I would probably say give yourself at least at least two weeks. I think a month is a nice amount of time for New Zealand. I think a month is a nice amount of time for anyone to be away. I think you start to get uh, ready to be home after three to four weeks. Uh, two weeks, I think, is a great amount of time for the North Island. But the longer, the better. That's, that's all I can say there. Uh, Solo is asking, is high-speed internet available everywhere? Pretty much, 5G is only just being rolled out, um, but you will find, and Wi-Fi was something we paid for for a very long time, but most places do have umbrella Wi-Fis now. Uh, Beth is asking, <laughs> will there be wetters in our hotel rooms? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> um, I doubt it. I very much doubt it. Look, you really don't see them. It's very unusual to see them. Poor old things have been hunted by our rats, and so they are, in fact, an endangered species now. And if you did get to see one, think of yourself as lucky. What is the meaning behind New Zealand being called the land of the long white cloud? From Victoria. So, Victoria, the Māori name for New Zealand is Aotearoa, which means the land of the long white cloud. It is said that Pupé's wife saw in the distance uh, a long cloud hanging on the horizon, and they had been uh, at sea for many many, many weeks uh, looking for Aotearoa or what they thought to be the land of the long white cloud when she called out, saw the cloud in the distance and called out and said, I think that is the land of the long white cloud. So that is the significance of the land of the long white cloud. 
Um, what is the connection with dragons and New Zealand? We have the uh, Tuatara. So the Tuatara, apart from dragons, I'd love to tell you we had real dragons in New Zealand. Um, we do, no we don't, but we do have the Tuatara. So this is one of the oldest living lizards in the world related to the dinosaur and he does look a little bit like a dragon. But the Tuatara is native uh, to New Zealand. You have lost your Kiwi accent. Yes, I have. But you know what? Australians still pick me as a Kiwi and Kiwis think I am Australian. So it's very difficult. I'm in a no man's land there. Daniel asks, how hard is it for people to immigrate? I believe if you're a self-funded retiree, it is reasonably easy. And also if you have a skill to offer, it is uh, reasonably easy. But all of the criteria to migrate to New Zealand is uh, listed on the New Zealand consulate. So have a look at that. It should have the links to it. Jane asks, have I been on the Trans Alpine train? Yes, it is magnificent. And that's the train I mentioned earlier that is from Christchurch through Arthur's Pass across to the West Coast and to Greymouth. Uh, Susan asks, how climate change has affected New Zealand? Well, our summers are getting brutally hotter uh, and we are experiencing longer periods of no rain. So we're starting to see what a drought in New Zealand perhaps would look like. We're also very heavily influenced by La Nina and El Nino. Um, this is supposed to be a wet year this year. So uh, let's just see what that combination brings because uh, scientists tell us the reason that the cyclone was so far south last year is largely due to the uh, warming of the planet. Um, if you have only time for one, do I prefer Milford sounds or doubtful sounds? Look, Milford sounds is the more easily accessed of the two. If I have time, I would go to Doubtful Sounds. Doubtful Sounds is magnificent. Uh, it is only accessible though if you're going on a boat. So if you had the choice, I would go to Doubtful Sounds. Uh, you mentioned the value of your jade. Uh, is the jewellery exported? Well, that is a great question asked by Anonymous. Now, um, the value can also just be uh, sentimental, but Māori believe that the power of uh, greenstone increases as it's passed on throughout a family. Uh, so it is sold overseas. What you do find is we tend to keep our nephrite jade in New Zealand and sell it there. Most countries around the world have a form of jade in, in one shape or another. So it would be unusual to find New Zealand nephrite jade, for example, being sold in Australia. Apart from the Australians would have something to say about that. The Australian stone, of course, is opal. Um, is Māori language taught in all schools? Uh, oh, look, great question. Uh, Māori, I learnt in school. I didn't learn all Māori, but I know little bits and pieces. A lot of Māori has crept into mainstream language. Um, some of us say kia ora. We say um, kai for food, um, puku for stomach. We say a lot of different things. Ka pai, for those of you that have travelled with me, you'll remember me saying that all the time which means all good okay uh as well as uh, a bunch of other words um but maori is taught as an elective in school and the maori national party who are running uh in this year's election are also hoping uh to have that change and make make it compulsory to be taught in uh, all schools in new zealand um are the maori new zealand culture and australian Aboriginal culture related, not at all. They are completely separate um, cultures. In fact, with a genetic mapping, we know for a fact, what well, interesting fact about uh, Australian Aboriginals is they share genetic markers with the Sri Lankan people. Maori people share genetic markers with the Taiwanese. So worlds apart and very, very, very different uh, cultures. I'm a tour guide for Australia as well. And they are talk and cheese. Uh, the name of the movie I mentioned that is great New Zealand humour, Hunt for the Wilder People. Hunt for the Wilder People. It is a great movie and the young star in it has also gone on to do other things in uh, Hollywood. Uh, Donna asks, what kind of public school system do we have? Uh, Donna, we have a really good public school system. Um, we... Some schools are better than others. We have a system called the decile system, um, but education in New Zealand, my own observation of education in New Zealand is that in overall, 
we have an exceptional education system. Um, and although not everybody goes on to tertiary education, there are a lot of opportunities uh, presented during your time at school. Um, question, where were you? Uh, where I, was I in Christchurch during the earthquake? Uh, <laughs> I could have been. Um, that was the year I, I actually had just given birth to my son. So no, I was sitting uh, in Australia. Uh, well, I wasn't, I was lying on the floor by the time I saw what had happened in Christchurch. It was, uh, it was a very uh, traumatic uh, couple of months. Uh, I did have a colleague, however, who was there with a the tour and uh, they had to, they couldn't go back into the hotel. Um, Michael asks, how are medical services Michael, I'm not sure where you've come from or where you are, but um, the medical system in New Zealand is excellent. Very, very good. Someone asks why I live in Australia. Well, I live in Australia, but I work in New Zealand. So uh, I grew up in New Zealand and I spent all of my life as a child wanting to travel. I got a job at the World Expo in Brisbane in 1988. So it gives you an idea of how old I am. And when I got here, I hated it. Uh, I'd come from Mount Cook and the snow. I'd come to the heat. I lost my mind uh, when I came to Australia, but I was very stubborn and determined not to go home and admit defeat. And so I stayed. And when I finally did go back to New Zealand, all my friends had left. Everyone had gone to different parts of the world. So I ended up coming back to, to Australia. But I am a tour guide for Australia and New Zealand, the South Pacific region. And part of my logic for becoming a guide was because then I got to go home and of course, show people New Zealand, which was something I often did as a child. Uh, do I ever organize wine tours for small groups from Nancy? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do, Nancy. Uh, when I say summer, you're thinking of June and July. Yeah, our summer months are the complete reverse, Heather. So, Right now, we are in spring, heading into summer. Christmas, of course, is smack bang in the middle of summer. So summer is technically from the 1st of December to the 1st of March. Um, the cost of living in New Zealand, is it easier to rent an apartment or buy a house? Cool, yeah. Well, you're going to be horrified when you find out what the cost of a house is in New Zealand. Uh, it never used to be that way, but we have become a very sought after address and with foreign investment, the way it's been pushed the prices of um, homes in New Zealand through the roof. Uh, it's probably cheaper to rent a house and then have a look um, for a place to live. But to be honest with you, home prices in Auckland, oh, uh, Auckland is not, I would probably live, uh, I live in the country. I live in the country in Australia as it is. So, um, the average cost of a home, and, and brace yourself, uh, in Auckland is $1.2 million. So it's not a cheap um, location, and that's because, really, uh, Auckland doesn't have a huge amount of land. You find people spreading out all of these new um, subdivisions are springing up, and they're further and further away from the, uh, from the city. Okay, Caroline asks, can you go into the Hobbit houses or just look at them from the outside? I'd like to stay in the Hobbit house, but you can't, you can go into it. There's not much in there. It is really just for show. But in my opinion, if somebody wanted to build those places, I would have one for my own home. That would be great. Um, the most exhilarating activity to do in New Zealand, bungee, jet boat and others, just being in New Zealand is exhilarating. Uh, I am not an adrenaline junkie, but you can do all of those things. You can bungee jump, you can uh, white water raft, black water raft. You can go out on the Hamilton jet, which is a New Zealand invention uh, for our very, very shallow shingle rivers and travel at speed down these rivers, not driving it. You can parapont, you can paraglide, you can luge, you name it, you can do it here in New Zealand. Um, is it safe for women to rent a camp van and travel around? Absolutely, Debbie. Uh, you will find that um, women are held in high regard. We are, it's a very much an egalitarian society and an equal society, society when it comes uh, to men and women. And Dan, you've asked a question. 
uh, here regarding uh, whether we are vegan friendly. Uh, yes, we are not just vegan, vegetarian, gluten free, lactose free, lacto ovo, you name it, we do it. Uh, and um, New Zealand uh, has some of the most beautiful uh, fresh produce uh, in the world. Question here, how much of the land in New Zealand was returned to Māori? Now, that's a difficult one to answer because uh, this, uh, the Waitangi Treaty, sorry, I can't read without glasses, um, the Waitangi Treaty was signed and then contested in the New Zealand High Court. And what, of course, happened is over the period of time from the signing of the treaty in 1840 to the contest, contestant of that some well over 100 years later, a lot of people have built on that land and some of those waterways are not available or the mountains been, um, you know, uh, got a ski resort on it or whatnot. So uh, it's hard to say. So we do say that a lot of uh, areas belong to different iwis. For example, my own family is uh, Naitahu, which is the bottom of the South Island. We are the green eyed Maoris and uh, the um, they have the land claim to, they can make a land claim to most of the land in the area there, but a lot of people don't, you know. It's just good enough to know that you can't do anything to that land without coming through the Māori people who are, I believe, environmentalists, which for me is really uh, important. Uh, how difficult is it for people to move to New Zealand? Uh, if you're retired, I don't believe it is that difficult. Um, again, just check on the consulate website. I think if you're a self-funded retiree, uh, you can uh, come here. But it is something that you'll need to look. Each country will have a different, uh, you know, different rules. So just depending on where you're coming from. Uh, are there any musicals or form of performing arts in that New Zealand is popular for? Okay, probably the Māori uh, stuff is the things that we are popular for. We have a really great music scene. Um, but off the top of my head, I can't think of any production. Um, the movies that have been made in the past, Whale Rider, The Piano, of course, Jan Campion's um, Piano, Lord of the Rings is the... Uh, the most recent uh, one, but in terms of plays or productions, I'm sorry, we, we don't um, have anything. We do have some things that are peculiarly Kiwi, uh, but you have to really be here to uh, experience them. They certainly haven't been exported anywhere. What's the best South Sea Island to stop at for a beach vacation after my New Zealand holiday en route back to the States? Well, you could easily go to Fiji. Uh, Fiji is great, but one of my most favourite places in the whole of the world, and I mentioned earlier on, is the Cook Islands. The Cook Islands is amazing, and it is uh, an extension of um, New Zealand because it's, a, it's a, um, a, a territory of New Zealand. I've just been asked here a question. Did I host a princess tour in Australia uh, February of 2019? Yes. It's me. <laughs> um, first time solo travellers are top tips for New Zealand. Okay, just we are friendly. That is the one thing that's really difficult to come uh, across on a presentation is New Zealand is friendly. And I hope those of you that have been here are nodding your heads. And I hope those of you that are coming here, uh, that that is the experience that you find. People are helpful. Look, you know, you could be broken down on the side of the road. Someone's going to stop. Um, we... Uh, apart from the dreadful uh, occurrence in uh, Christchurch last year, um, guns are not permitted. It's a safe country to come to. Come with an open mind and um, lots of money. <laughs> is probably the uh, I think that is an awesome way to wrap up our Q&A for today. You've been through more than 100 questions. I totally appreciate your time. I know that everybody on the on, on Zoom and Facebook are, are so excited about um, New Zealand and I think we're all gonna hop on a plane as soon as this travel restriction ban is lifted. I, I cannot I thank so. you enough. And, and audience out there who are still on for this very long Q&A, thank you very much too. I know that, um, I wanna say we are recording this, so obviously it will be posted for more people to view it. But uh, I cannot thank you enough, Melissa, you, you are a new friend all the way on the other side of the world. So I look forward to meeting you again one day on your side. But um, from here and everyone else, thank you and good night. Kakite, my friends. Kakite. All right.